<laughs> okay, I'm calling to order a PVUSD, <laughs> you guys, PVUSD board meeting Wednesday, March 13th, 2019. Are there any public comments on closed session? Francisco. Um, thank you, Francisco Rodriguez, President with Pajaro Valley Federation of Teachers. Um, I'm, I am here hoping that I am not setting a precedent. As you know, um, I have never come before you to advocate for a uh, member that is being recommended for non-reelection because we trust as teachers, as taxpayers, and I'm sure you as trustees trust that uh, the proper protocols, procedures, uh, both contractual and by Ed Code, have been followed, and that the administration is right in making uh, specific recommendations when it comes to the livelihood of our members, and so of our probationary members. And so, um, having said that, um, I am here to ask that uh, you do not approve the recommendation for non-reelection for employee number 7447. Uh, this is a uh, adult education uh, teacher that uh, has not been evaluated once in the two years as an employee. Um, there was, her hours were uh, change against uh, the contract and her schedules uh, were up in the air for a while. In fact, she was originally hired as a counselor but then reassigned to a what I call made up position because it is a position that you have not yet approved. And um, in addition, um, had the administration done its job and evaluated this probationary teacher the first semester that she was employed, the administration could have reduced her hours because that is allowed by contract. Had the administration uh, shared concerns, uh, their concerns with the employee and provided the support that the employee needed, um, we wouldn't be in this position. On the contrary, the administration played derogatory material in her personnel file, alluding to the evaluating her to uh, clarify her or clarify the duties of the position. And as you all know, that is not the purpose of an evaluation. So you may be told that uh, this particular employee misplaced some files, but the fact is that this particular employee made recommendations to the department on how to keep track of files because apparently losing files in the department is not uncommon. Um, uh, the other problem you'll probably be told about is that the employee misses appointments with students. Uh, however, when you are uncertain of your schedule, your location, or your times of uh, your start and end times um, because they are constantly changed. It lends itself to missing an appointment now and then if indeed it is true that she missed appointments. Um, anyway, we recommend that you um, not approve the recommendation and allow for this employee to be evaluated uh, next year. And there is a process in place, the peer assistance and review, uh, if the uh, employee is not meeting the expectations uh, so that uh, they can be uh, supported. And if there is no improvement, then they can be let go. Thank you. Oh, I was gonna ask you, isn't there something in the contract that when you put stuff in their file that they have 10 days to respond? Correct, we, um, in the interest of not complicating the matter for, for uh, the district or, or the union, thinking that uh, we would be able to resolve a simple misunderstanding of when the department can and cannot 
uh, reduced hours. Uh, we found material in her personnel file of which she sh she had not been notified so uh, that has respond. been uh, placed in in there. So sh there was no way for her to re uh, respond to it. And she because yes. she supposedly is supposed to have ten days to be able to do that, right? That's in correct. In terms of your contract, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, hi, Alejandro, too. <laughs> Hello, good afternoon. Uh, again, just like Francisco, you're not gonna see me usually here advocating on issues that, that are related with termination, because I trust and let the district uh, move through the motions of this process. But we do have an employee in transportation, he's a bus driver, who um, possibly the district wants to recommend termination, and. I truly do believe that based on the merits of the situation, based on the incident that took place, that this does not merit to put this person through the termination process. We have progressive discipline in our contract, and I believe that based on, on the issues, based on who this person is, he has worked for the district for over 12 years. He, when you look at his evaluations, they're always graded as outstanding. He has never had any disciplinary issues with the district. And I don't believe, I, I don't understand why we have to put this person through a, ter a termination process. So I would hope that the board can reconsider and put him through the progressive discipline that we have in our contract. That's all. Thank you. Okay. We will now go into closed session to discuss one expulsion referral, certificated public employee appointment, um, employment government code section 54957, 2.2, 2.3 classified public employee appointment, um, appointment employment <laughs> government code section 54957, 2.4 negotiations update, 2.5 public employee discipline dismissal release leaves. 2.6 existing anticipated pending litigation, 2.7 resolution 18-19-30, non-reelection of certain probationary certificated employees. Thank you. Okay, I might have, might do this. <laughs> oh, we have to, more people have to come. That's true. You can talk. Come on, everybody. Okay, N now I'm going to do this. <laughs> Welcome everyone to our meeting on March 13th, Wednesday, and we are happy to see you all here with us. <laughs> okay, for the Republic for which it stands, one nation, 
under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Tenemos un traductor. Yo creo que es Virginia otra vez, ¿verdad? Virginia. Ahí está. Entonces, si necesitan que uh, el traductor que, que, es, que le va a dar las translaciones, um, se puede hablar con ella y conseguir los aparatos. Ok. Um, Now it's time for Dr. Rodriguez to give her comments. Yeah, thank you. Well, this week began the application process for our second annual Summer in the City Internship Program. So this program provides a leadership and government learning experience with the City of Watsonville and also with PBUSD. So the program is for incoming high school juniors and seniors only from our school district. So it's something very special for us. So, esta semana comenzó el proceso para nuestro segundo programa anual de internos para el programa vierno en la ciudad y también el distrito. Este programa da una experiencia de aprendizaje y de liderazgo y gobierno en la ciudad de Watsonville y también el distrito. El programa es solamente para los estudiantes de nuestro distrito y los que estarán en los grados de 11 y 12 en el, año el próximo año escolar. So the internship will be from Monday, June 17th to Friday, July 5th. And our PVUSD teachers will be teaching from 9 to 12 noon, and the internship will be from 1 to 5 p.m. And students will be able to work throughout the city as well as with our public information officer, our technology department, and our business department. So, ese programa de internos estará, será el lunes 17 de junio hasta el viernes 5 de julio. A nuestros maestros de nuestro distrito va a enseñar desde la 9 de la mañana hasta las 11 y el horario de interno será el, a la 1 hasta las 5 de la tarde. So, los estudiantes podrán trabajar en la ciudad y también con nuestro oficial de información pública, nuestro departamento de tecnología y también el departamento de negocios. So students will receive 2.5 elective credits and a $500 stipend, and we encourage all to apply. The deadline is Friday, May 3rd, 2019 by 5 p.m. Um, I just want to note for the public, the $500 stipend is, is through the city, and so it is not using public funds. Um, um, los estudiantes van a recibir um, 2.5 créditos electivos y también $500. Um, este dinero viene desde la ciudad de Watsonville y queremos que todos traten de aplicar. La fecha límite para aplicar es el, 3, el viernes 3 de mayo um, a las 5 de la noche. So, thank you, and we hope that it's another great experience for our students. Okay. Now I'm going to have board comments, and let's see how I will start this time. <laughs> How about this way? What? Oh, you did? Oh, I thought Maria started last time. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's good to be here. I know I only have a minute, so I've done lots of things. Uh, oh, whoops. <laughs> I, I just want everybody to know that uh, me, other trustees in the district, we're working to do the best we can for Measure L funds. I've been at Minnie White, I've been to E Hall, and I've been to Watsonville High, and we are working what we said we were gonna do. Um, the, yesterday, I went to Sacramento on behalf of the CSBA, and we had a chance to interact with our elected officials. I talked to Bill Monning and Assembly Member uh, Rivas. Um, I told them, you know, there was lots of other people there, but with the help of Michelle, um, I told them that I would talk about uh, we need more transportation for special needs students. Um, right now we contribute 5.3 million a year with a total cost of 7.9 and we only receive 
of state funding. I also talked about Proposition 51 where we're in line. So I told the Assembly Member Rivas to please release those funds so we can get them. And I also brought up the point that we need more guidance counselors. I know we talked about a couple of meetings ago. Right now it's currently 400 students per guidance counselor. And we need to get back that get that back down to 250, at least somewhere right there. So that's what I was doing. Thank you very much. I'm going to keep it short since we started a little late tonight. I want to thank uh, everybody here in the audience for coming. Um, I did attend a PVPSA. That's our um, nonprofit that um, helps um, children and families in our district with behavioral health and mental health problems and issues. I attended that meeting. Last night I attended um, for Kids Foundation, which I'm the chair of that board, and I um, would appreciate um, this district's help. We've got money to help kids with critical issues. So if there's something in a kid's life that would make a big difference or change for them, I invite everybody to submit a referral to the Four Kids Foundation, Monterey Bay, and we'll try to fund um, things that will make a critical difference in the life of a child. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Good evening, everyone, um, and thank you for joining us tonight. There's a couple of exciting things um, underway. Um, in collaboration with the Friends of Watsonville Parks and Community Services nonprofit, we have secured funding to improve and potentially expand the community garden at Alianza Charter School, uh, pending the approval of the location from a district administration, of course. Um, we have that verification project scheduled um, for some time in May. I will provide more details as soon as, um, as, as the data approaches so that all board members hopefully are able to participate as part of that project. Um, I also attended our first intergovernmental committee meeting with Trustee Holm and Shocker, and Trustee Shocker last week, and we're moving in the right direction. Extensive work has already been done to determine the future of the Mellow Center, how to maximize its use, um, and also how we can collaborate with the City of Waxonville as far as making sure that we take care of all the maintenance, different maintenance projects um, to that facility. Um, also, given the limited amount of park space within the City of Watsonville, uh, I'm also very happy to report that we have a pi pilot initiative underway to open EA Hall and Minty White uh, playground and fields uh, to the community as part of a joint use agreement with the city. Um, if this pilot program proves to be successful, there may be room for expanding the use of our facilities. And again, it's, it's a joint use agreement where both the district and the city um, will be putting money to make sure that we maintain those facilities that we open to the community. I also attended our elementary school LCAP input session, and that was the most fun. Um, <laughs> it was great to um, see the children interact with one another. Um, they had great ideas um, as far as um, feedback goes uh, towards innovative programs, our 21st century learning environments, and um, their school culture and climate. And I'm also looking forward to attending our DLAC meeting next Tuesday. Thank you. Good evening. So I attended the Special Education Local Plan Area uh, <laughs> Community Advisory Committee. And that evening we heard about the effects, both positive and negative, of screen time on kids and their families. And I, I wanted to just take a moment to say that these meetings are a tremendous resource. Uh, to the com to our communities and even as an experienced parent I walk away from these meetings learning something new each time and I, I've, I've been very impressed by them and I would encourage people to to attend um, attending the intergovernmental committee meeting um, there are so many links particularly the conversations about open spaces so many links between staying active and healthy and, and having school success and our communities need access to safe open spaces to realize that potential I also attended um, the uh, Migrant Education Speech and Debate Showcase and Rio Del Mar Elementary's uh, production of uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And just acknowledging these kids who really, you know, took it takes something to be in public, on a stage, in front of people, and they did that. And I'm so proud of them. Thank you, everyone. I apologize. I'm not feeling well tonight. So if I get up and run out of the room, it's nothing personal. <laughs> um, 
Anyways, um, it's been busy. Um, I'm not going to elaborate anymore on the Intergovernmental um, Committee that we did last week with the city, but we will talk that we are advocating the crosswalk issue. Um, the city is aware of that. Um, we're aware of the need for safer crosswalks um, close to Landmark and Radcliffe. Um, that is, is being addressed as we speak. Um, I was also able to go to see some science experiments with some of the kids at Watsonville Charter School of the Arts. Um, their in innovation never ceases to amaze me. This was the younger kids, second and third graders. So it was fun to see what they have been coming <laughs> up with. Um, working with um, Danny Dodge, thank you very much, and Dr. Rodriguez. Um, we will be doing a open forum at Landmark Elementary School with our mayor, Paco Estrada, and that will be taking place on April 11th, and this is open to the public to address any community concerns, um, community action items, or questions that you might have. Um, we are trying to partner with the city to make more programs available, um, partnering with the police department for safety and crosswalks, safety and getting to school, safety in the classrooms for our, our children. Um, and I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you. Hello. Good evening and welcome, everyone. Um, in keeping light with my colleagues, we're sorry for being late, so I'm going to keep it short. Um, I had the privilege since our last board meeting to attend the meet and greet of elected women in Santa Cruz County event. It was great to meet and speak with so many other women who serve as elected officials within our county. It was great hearing their stories and reasons behind why so many women in our county have chosen to run for local elected offices. Um, ad additionally, while meeting so many women who serve in our county as elected officials, it was also great to discuss um, with them, s as so many of them were also serving on other um, school boards throughout the county, it was very interesting to discuss with them similar and different issues that affect our local schools and our community. Um, it was also very inspiring to talk about and discuss in, um, inspiring other young women in our county and community to run for local elected offices. Um, I also want to note for the public record um, that I am appointing Ari Parker as my appointee to the Parhoro Valley Education Foundation. And then... Um, Kind of sadly on one last note, and I'm sort of sad to end on this, um, I'm sorry to see that the student award that I have been handed to pass out tonight actually has an incorrect board president signature, so hopefully we could get that corrected for our students um, going forward. This is the first I've seen since we've had a transition, so hopefully we could get that corrected, please. Thank you. So I'm going to try to be quick because I have done quite a few things. Um, I went to a migrant parent advisory committee that is at the Pajaro Middle School. And it was kind of great because each person who um, has a committee in their school actually got up with a microphone and talked about what their committee meeting was doing, which I thought was good. And then um, a, I forgot, he's a community something, his his position, he, he came from Salud para la Gente, and he talked about all their programs, of course. And then he talked about social networking, the good parts of social net networking and the negative parts of social networking. And he showed us a video that was a little bit scary about the negative <laughs> things that can happen with social networking. <laughs> um, so I also went to the Migrant Head Start policy committee meeting and um, one of the things that happened was one of their coordinators had talked about and gave a handout about their monthly themes that they have at for migrant head start and it was really cute there was a um, very cute video on um, their theme of insects it's very cute and um, instead of a sandbox they had a soil box that had plants and insects in it, and they've done lots of great art and stuff. It was really great. I also went to <laughs> Dr. Rodriguez's staff meeting she's having now um, with schools, and I went to the one that was at Pajaro Middle School. <laughs> 
and she talked all of course what all that we're doing academically and all the stuff that we're doing now and um, teachers were asked to go to different um, parts of the room where they had things like a signs about innovation empowerment integrity and many more and they put little things about how they thought about those those kinds of things and then um, she took time to answer she gave them each little cards so they could put all their questions on it and she answered as many questions as she could and then she told them that all of the questions she wasn't able to answer before we had to end, she would answer them on her weekends. <laughs> so she answered all the rest of the questions that she wasn't able to answer right then at the staff meeting. She answered them. She answered them. <laughs> um, I went to the National Agricultural Day luncheon. So agriculture is our present here in Watsonville, and it is our future agriculture <laughs> it was a really good event the last thing I was able to do I went to an, an event in Santa Cruz for the International Women's Day it was International Women's Day it was <laughs> and um, I'm not gonna tell you all about it because take too long but they had a panel of speakers they had food they had a little workshop at the end that I went to it's really good too thank you <laughs> high school students, and I think we have Aptos today, don't we? <laughs> okay, so um, good evening, everybody. Um, so on March 8th was the last day to pay for AP exams or make the deposit. Oh, I'm Gage. <laughs> I had to say I'm a junior. <laughs> anyway, so um, the AP exams take place on May 6th through the 17th. And uh, currently, right now, Aptos staff, a lot of the teachers, are writing letters of recommendations for seniors to submit to their colleges. And then uh, Saturday, school is continuing this weekend, even though it got canceled last weekend because of a lacrosse tournament. And then uh, the Cabrillo planning sessions are still in place. and. Uh, are taking place tomorrow, March 14th. Um, hi, I'm Kalai. Um, so yes, or last night, um, choir had their annual uh, concert, Celebrate and Song, from 7 to 9.30 in the PAC. The performances were really great, and the turnout was really good as well. And theater students are looking forward to their trip to Ashland, Oregon, next month, which is um, the theater capital of our country and um, students will watch a variety of plays performances and participate in workshops to improve their skills hi I'm Sophia and so for activities we are still currently selling prom bids and our location for prom this year is at the coconut grove and the theme is golden gala which is in honor of Aptos High's 50 year anniversary next year is our spring spirit week and the theme is road trip our spring club carnival is set for March 26th. Hi, I'm Riley. So our spring sports have just started and softball and baseball have been postponed for a little while, but now they're s starting off and both of them have a record of two and one. Track won their first league um, meet on Thursday versus Santa Cruz. Our lacrosse team hosted a tournament this weekend and it was really great. Um, boys tennis has a strong start of four and one, and our bo boys volleyball team currently is two and one, and they have a game against PCS tonight. And cheer and song palm tryouts are next week. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. So tonight we are recognizing two students. Um, the first student is Antonia Rodriguez Rivera Amesti Elementary. And bring your family up. Everybody should come up. Oh, the whole family, the whole family, the whole family. Thank you. 
Come on, family. <laughs> Here we go. Come face face the board. There you go. Okay. There you go. Okay. Good evening, President Osmondson, Superintendent Rodriguez, and esteemed members of the board. I would like to introduce Antonia and her family, Feliciano Julia, her mom and dad, her sister Ariana, and her little sister Dariana. And I would like to introduce Mr. Hayes. El maestro va a hablar acerca de Antonia, pero quiero reconocer todos los maestros que eran sus maestras desde chiquita. So Mr. Hayes is going to speak. Hi, good evening. It's good to see you all here. Muy buenas noches. Uh, good evening, trustees, and to everyone, and especially the Mesty staff. Thanks, you guys, for being here. Uh, I'm John Hayes. I'm a teacher, fifth grade teacher at a Mesty, and I have been given the honor and the pleasure to speak on behalf of a Mesty staff and community to recognize the skills and talents and achievements of Antonia Rodriguez Rivera. So Antonia has attended a Mesty since kindergarten. Now she's in fifth grade, and she's impressed us since the early grades with her initiative and her perseverance and resourcefulness academically, and her maturity and creativity and determination as a child. The teachers and staff who know her see in Antonia exceptional critical thinker and a creative thinker. She brings to our classrooms and her peers an excitement and enthusiasm for learning. I certainly know that when Antonia raises her hand in my class to contribute to our class conversation, I call on her. And she often begins with the phrase, I have a question. <laughs> we also recognize early on that Antonia has an extraordinarily comforting fluency with language. She excelled through our bilingual program at Amesti, and today she's an above grade level reader in both English and Spanish. She also speaks El Idioma Mixteco in one of the languages she speaks with her family. And when she was in first grade, she created a trilingual dictionary in which, uh, which by itself is, is remarkable for a first grader, uh, but uh, not sufficient for Antonia. Typical for her, she turned the dictionary into a trilingual video which earned national recognition from NAVE, the Bilingual Education Association. <laughs> and she was one of five students nationally to receive this acclaim. Um, locally, she is involved in our county's language ambassador program. In fact, the video she made a few years ago is on the County Office of Education Language Ambassadors website, if you'd like to check it out. Um, just as cute, only just a little bit, a little shorter, a few years younger. <laughs> <laughs> and recently she represented a Mesty at the County Spelling Bee. Well, now that she's 11 years old and we are going to soon, lo soon lose her to middle school, um, we still appreciate her intellect and her work ethic. I get to see it every single day. We enjoy hearing her questions, giving her opportunities to challenge herself, and seeing how she expresses her ideas with confidence and creativity. So in the future, she has expressed interest in studying medicine or researching cures for diseases like cancer. But all we know at this time is that we sincerely believe that Antonia will meet whatever goals she sets for herself. And we know that she'll continue to help and support her family. She understands the importance of family and the caring for each other. And this is evident every day at school when she frequently checks on our little sister Ariana in second grade, stopping by the classroom, saying hi, seeing how we're doing over there. If the mission in our district is in part to support learners in reaching their highest potential and prepare them for the future, we're off to a great start with Antonia. But we don't have to wait for the future to appreciate what she brings to our school community today. For us as educators in her life, she is a reminder that students make positive contributions right here, right now. They are role models right now. And they're making our world better right now. So we're grateful for Antonia, what she has given to us. And we, uh, we're excited for her future and what she will achieve and how she will continue to inspire the children and adults in her life. Antonia, felicidades. Muchísimas gracias.
On behalf of the uh, Power Valley Unified School District, I want to present you with this certificate of recognition for everything that you've done, all of the success that you had up to this point, and to your bright future. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. Muy buenas noches a todos. Uh, soy la mamá de Antonia y le quiero felicitar a mi niña que se está yendo muy bien la escuela. Good Estoy evening, muy everyone. orgullosa de ella. I'm her mother and I just want to congratulate her because she's doing so well in school. I am very proud of her. Y me siento muy orgullosa de ella y les estoy les digo que le eche muchas ganas y les agradezco a todos los maestros. I, I ask her to continue to do her best, and I, I am very grateful to all the teachers who, who have um, supported her and uh, through through this um, through her school. Yo la felicito también. I congratulate her too. Flower face. Very special. Um, the next st student is named Rodolfo Ortiz and Soldo Elementary. I'm hoping I can get through this without coughing. Um, good evening, President Osmondson, uh, Superintendent Rodriguez, and esteemed board members, and everybody else that's here to celebrate. We also have one of those future leaders. His name is Rodolfo Ortiz, and we are here to brag about him. He is a shining example of what it means to be an all-star student at Ann Soldo Elementary. He is friendly and fair towards his classmates. He takes full advantage of the learning opportunities that are presented to him, and he is known by students and teachers to be trustworthy and respectful. We appreciate his family, who is supportive and encouraging. They, too, are an important factor in his success. His former, st his former teachers had great things to say about him. Ms. Gold shared that even in first grade, critical thinking came naturally to Rodolfo. He was always the one to ask, I wonder what would happen if, or I know another way this could work. His mind works like a computer, always scanning for connections, while his creative thinking skills lead him to imagine what only a bright child can do. Rodolfo has all of the abilities we hope for in a student, abilities to take us into a future that requires innovative solutions. His third grade teacher, Mr. Knight, remembers Rodolfo for his thoughtful work and keen observations. He did not need motivation from his teacher. He seemed 
ready to go, ready to be motivated every day. He was always ready to learn and was always excited about what he was doing and optimistic about what he was going to do. <coughs> His fourth grade teacher, Ms. Martinez, Ms. Martinez, highlights Rodolfo for being an avid reader. She says he was never without a book in class. She shared that he has a great vocabulary and strong insights about theme and characters. He showed an interest in animals, specifically how to stop more animals from becoming extinct. He worked hard to understand new and challenging concepts, particularly enjoying science. His current teacher, Ms. Mallard, added that Rodolfo is an academically advanced student, very well-rounded and kind. He is a pleasure to have in class. Rodolfo shows great initiative. He is over 100% on ST math and on to the sixth grade syllabus. He represented Ann Soldo at the county spelling bee and during the recent LCAP student session in this very room. Rodolfo is a member of the recently formed student art club that is also led by one of our teachers here, Ms. Schaefer, and definitely a fan of our school library where, quote, Rodolfo says, there are many amazing books that you can have a laugh at or just be so deeply interested in that you won't want to put the book down. We're thrilled to celebrate Rodolfo as well as his wonderful family. Thank you. Okay, <coughs> approval of the agenda. Can I have a motion? Move approval. I'll second. I will call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Um, I'm missing somebody, so it's 6 0. Um, so now approval of the minutes from February 27th. Can I have a motion? Move approval. I'll second. I will call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? We're still 6-0. Somebody's not here? Okay, public comments. Danny. <laughs> All right, first off we have Cordelia and Neff. Hello, uh, my name is Cordelia Neff. Thank you so much for having me. I'm here on behalf of the Santa Cruz Symphony. Um, Monday and Tuesday this week, we were actually at the Mellow Center in Watsonville uh, presenting a free program, a free concert to the fourth and fifth graders of this county. Um, this has started actually mm -hmm. a while ago, the process for this. We've been doing these concerts for over 30 years now. But two years ago, we really changed the game. We partnered with Carnegie Hall to bring a program that they call Link Up to the county. So what this does is it partners with classroom and music teachers to actually teach the students the songs that we'll be playing at a concert. Um, we partnered with Audrey Sirota at the COE and your own Sue Graltzi here at um, Pajaro. And we did uh, teacher trainings, um, four of them. And uh, Audrey did some private ones as well. And then the kids have now been learning on recorder as well as uh, singing and clapping, doing hand movements. The, they're all jazzed up. And it was, <laughs> I was honestly moved to tears yesterday morning as they were just singing loudly at the top of their lungs to the Blue Danube and the Toreador. It was so exciting. And then they were learning their recorders and like do, 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 do. Do, do, like all on recorder, these fourth and fifth graders, um, full halls, it was great. Um, we do have one more. 
Santa Cruz goes last this week, so they will be tomorrow morning. If you'd like to see these, these concerts in action, we have missed now the, the mellow ones, but we do have two at the Santa Cruz Civic tomorrow, 9.30 and 11. And I really, I can't encourage you enough to come and see them. They're really fantastic. Um, to get on with my three minutes, we also have an event here on March 23rd at the Watsonville Public Library. We're doing these events now quarterly. We call them classical overtures, and they're just kind of a way to introduce ourselves to the community, to just say a little bit more than what the three minutes at public meetings allows, talk about our education program. So in, a, in addition to these concerts that we're doing this week, we have an in-classroom music listening program as well as scholarships and open rehearsals. Uh, we have an extensive concert programming throughout the year, so we just talk about all of that, and that will be again on March 23rd at the Watsonville Public Library at 2 p.m. I have flyers if anyone's interested. And that's pretty much wrapping up. Thank you so much. Hmm? Yes, thank you. Next, we have Bill Beecher. Madam President, uh, Dr. Rodriguez, uh, trustees and staff, uh, I have three items I wanted to bring up this evening. One has to do with the board packet. Um, you guys get it on Friday. Uh, this year, there's been a change that it's made available to the public on Sundays. and. Um, that created a problem for me tonight because we're doing the second interim review a little later. There's 200 pages to go through. That's pretty hard to do in a day or two days and be ready to come in here and talk. Uh, it used to be the practice of this district to make that available on Fridays to the public. And I would suggest that we should go back to that in the future to allow people like myself sufficient time to review the packet. I'm sure PVFT would love to have seen the packet early so that they could go through the second interim. <clears throat> the uh, second issue is uh, last fall I brought up that we haven't had uh, a review of our health plan from the provider. Uh, what, do our, what are the charges versus what we're paying? $40 million we should be having a review. And I think uh, President... Uh, um, <laughs> yes, had, had suggested at that time that that seemed like a good idea. I still think it's a good idea. I thought that there was a suggestion that it should be put on the agenda. Haven't seen it. Then lastly, also last fall, uh, Trustee Orozco suggested that we should combine uh, the celebration you know, students and so forth to once a year so that we could save time for board meetings. Many of these board meetings go well past 1030. I know that you guys don't like staying that long. I don't. So uh, I think we ought to bring up that suggestion again and uh, inculcate that into future plans. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry, I have actually a question or a comment. Um, Mr. Beecher brought up a good point because I recall that when I first came on this board, we did publish the agendas um, always on Fridays between 4 and 5 p.m. roughly. It was maybe around the time we started going through our really contentious negotiations issues that they started getting published on Sundays between 5 and 6, which I still recognize falls in compliance with the Brown Act, but it doesn't create, create for the public um, that much of a transparency issue, which I think is very concerning. Um, and I could speak as a board member, I would agree with Mr. Beecher, it doesn't even give us as board members that much adequate time to review the backup that is in you know, the agenda. So you know, I know the city of Watsonville, they meet on Tuesdays, they publish their agenda Thursdays by 5 p.m. Maybe we could look to get back on that track. I think Mr. Beecher brings up a good point about that. And I also think he also brings up a good point. We have discussed that in the past board about um, the student recognition awards 
Um, we all love that component of the board meeting, um, but maybe it, it could be consolidated into one special board meeting um, or trustees can go to the sites, you know, something. Maybe we need to refigure something with that. So I'd like to ask the agenda setting committee to, you know, put that on um, their agenda to take and think about that and um, also y both those items because they both fall within you, you three. And the Secretary of Work, Superintendent Rodriguez. Thank you. Quickly, can I have now the unions, which is PVFT, Pato Valley Federation of Teachers? Thank you, Francisco Rodriguez. Um, I just wanted to uh, make a couple comments on um, the number of grievances that we have opened. Uh, most of them are grievances that we are able to sit down and um, resolve. Um, unfortunately, uh, over half of them all come from that same department, adult education, um, and they are some of the most egregious uh, grievances. Uh, over the last uh, year, um, you know, our members have been, as I explained earlier, uh, cut hours against the contract. Uh, in fact, they have not been evaluated. In fact, um, only six teachers in the last three years have been evaluated in that department. Um, you heard earlier from our um, uh, sister union, uh, CSEA, uh, with some uh, concerns as well. Um, I think that um, there needs to be uh, you as tr trustees need to give the directive um, to look into this matter uh, to ensure that um, the contract is followed. Uh, PVFT is doing its, its part by uh, trying to resolve these uh, grievances. Um, in fact, uh, our chief negotiator, Nelly Baquera Boggs, um, made sure that the administrators each had a contract um, at our last meeting with them, gave them the contract and suggested that they read it uh, prior to making any uh, uh, decisions. And um, we are not uh, their supervisors, and so that's the extent of what we can do. Uh, but you uh, have the power to provide direction to the administration uh, to hopefully settle this matter and uh, re uh, make sure that uh, teachers there are being evaluated and that uh, they are treated as per contract. Thank you. This is still PVFT. <laughs> Hi, I'm Nelly Vaquera Boggs. I'm the chief negotiator. Um, so good evening, um, board and Dr. Rodriguez. So a month ago, I stood before you to present our proposal to negotiate. Uh, we have communicated with the district of our readiness to schedule negotiations since December. We were asked to wait, and in January, we communicated our eagerness to get started so that our membership could have a settled contract before the school year ends. Again, we were asked to wait, despite having attended the, the governor's proposal for the 1920 budget. So that's, we waited, that happened, we waited some more. <clears throat> so now we've been asked to wait for the May revise or also for the health and welfare benefits change. So there's always something to wait for. Um, and although we have had some successful agreements working with um, you know, collaborative efforts with uh, HR, we really do like working with Chona a lot, thank you. Um, we've you know, had successful agreements in regards to the migrant teacher bilingual stipends, CTE, and hopefully the math and science single subject. Um, agreement, so PBFT members are ready to negotiate a contract that attracts and retains highly qualified educators, counselors, psychologists, nurses, and speech and language therapists and pro program specialists. People that will help ensure that our students are achieving their best. Um, Dr. Kyleen has stated that she will be sunshining the district's proposals at the next board meeting on March 27th. That's something that she assured me of. I suspect their proposals might include some cuts to our members in so at some capacity, but I really do hope that I can be proven wrong with that suspicion. 
Our students deserve qualified teachers, counselors, psychologists, nurses, speech and language therapists, and program specialists from ECE to adult ed. We need people who are going to be here for the long haul um, so that our students can go back and visit them <laughs> when they get, you know, as they grow into adulthood. Um, so thank you. Okay, can we have CSEA? Alejandro, are you coming? And more. Hello, good evening, members of the board. Alejandro Madi and labor rep for CSEA and Diana Martinez are one of our executive board members for the chapter. Uh, well, let me start with the good news first. So I wanted to, first of all, on behalf of the chapter and our membership, thank the members of the board for approving the summer assistance program. We were able to enroll more than 300 of our members into the program over the last two months. Mm -hmm. it, it was well received by the membership, mm -hmm. um, especially for our members, our members who are the lowest paid and who see this program as a benefit and as an encouragement to continue to work in education. Um, I would also like to thank Joe and Chona and the district for collaborating with us with resources and with information that made it much, much easier to be able to help the membership with all the questions that they had about this new program that was put out there by the state. So on our part, we're gonna continue to lobby the state to see if we can make this program ongoing and can be a, a new benefit that our 10th and 11th month employees can have. Um, on another note, um, you know, we're gonna be celebrating for the first time since we negotiated uh, this new holiday, the Cesar Chavez holiday. Mm -hmm. We're gonna be celebrating it on the Friday of spring break, so the first week of April. And, and again, our members are happy to be able to celebrate this, not just because it's a day off, but because of the significance of the role that Cesar Chavez played here in the Watsonville area. And to, to you know, when I heard you talk about the agriculture uh, <laughs> committee that you went to, yeah. agriculture was the past, is the present, and will continue to be the future of our region. And I really, really hope that in the coming years that we can actually make this a, a holiday for the whole district because there's a lot of history of the movement that Cesar Chavez did in this region and the significance that it has to the children of today. And so I hope that in the coming future that we can honor this to be a holiday for all of our community in, in the Pajaro Valley uh, Unified School District. All right, so, so that was the good news. Okay, so let's talk about negotiations. Uh, we're going to be sunshining soon for the 1918-19 school year. So hopefully by the April board meeting, we'll have our initial proposal. Um, I did have a chance to look at the second interim, and I did go through all of it. Uh, it's kind of like what I do all the time. And just to let you know that where we're heading in the district, Always remember, because I don't want the naysayers to say that, oh, you know, the union is the one that breaks the bank. Always remember that we're here to work with the district to ensure that we have the finances and that we have the, the budget to be able to continue to support our community, that we're here to work with the district, that we're here to work with the teachers, with everyone that, that's part of this community to ensure that we have agreements that are fiscally sound for, for the district, for our members, and for the community. Um, another thing, you know, just as an example of an area where probably the district can save money is how we utilize the lawyers here in Pajaro Valley. Um, one of the things that I've been a strong advocate of is of not having lawyers at the table because this is my only district of the many that I represent where we had a lawyer at the table and we had to schedule our meetings on the calendar of the lawyer. We had to wait for the lawyer's input to be able to you know, move forward with what we were proposing. And I just have to say that you know, we have smart, articulate, creative people in this district, uh, both in management and in our members. And I can speak on behalf of PVFT to say that that's also the case. 
And we, you know, when the labor rep is hired by CSCA, we have to sign this agreement that we cannot put out proposals to the district that are unlawful. So nothing that we propose is kind of like a gotcha moment of tricking the district to go and agree on something that's unlawful. Everything that we do has to be legal and has to be ensure that we're proposing things that, that are within the law and the Ed Code. So I hope that as we start negotiations, that it can be more of the family here in Pajaro Valley and not have the lawyers so much be involved in the process of negotiations. Mm -hmm. Just my, my peace of mind on that. Um, so that's mostly what I have. We will be bringing the initial proposal and I'll pass the mic to Diana. Good evening, uh, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez and Cabinet. Um, I'd like to start off with we, um, our e-board was invited to participate in the labor, um, the LMI, the Labor Management Initiative. Uh, we were excited that we were invited to this and we learned a lot in those two days. And um, when we met afterwards, after our meetings on the second day, um, I did, you know, uh, vocally say that I was excited that we're coming together and becoming unified as one, as Pajaro Valley <coughs> unified, the word unified is, is in PVUSD. And I felt this is a step, huge step forward to be able to settle things and, and come to agreements and instead of battling because it shouldn't be a battle. Because we're here for, you know, the kids. This is our, our city, our legacies here, and the families, the majority live here, and their, you know, families continue on living here in Watsonville. And we wanna be able to provide the best service as possible for our own community. Um, so with, with that said, um, again, I'm so excited, and I'm hoping that that excitement is not deflated at one point, <laughs> but that we continue to work together and to become one. Thank you. Okay, now I have Pavam, Pato Valley Association of Managers, anyone? Nope. How about CWA, which is the Communication Workers of America? Okay, um, 8.1. Approval of amendment number one to facilitate lease for the Pottle Valley High School play field. <laughs> Upgrade and site improvements, yay. <laughs> All right, good evening members of the board, uh, Superintendent Rodriguez, uh, administration and members of the public. I am very pleased and excited to uh, present this item. Uh, if you recall back in um, uh, May of 2018, the board approved uh, for the district to proceed uh, with the lease lease back uh, delivery method and to pursue an RFP to solicit um, contractors. And in that process, we um, went through and we provided that RFP throughout the state. Um, the firm that was selected was Kent Construction. And uh, since that award, we have been working very hard with Kent Construction facility staff and other district staff to go through and we did a constructability review identify uh, potential uh, obstacles within the project, um, review the architectural plans, the layout, uh, you name it. And so the team has very uh, worked very hard on that. I mean, up to um, probably a couple hours before this meeting, we've been uh, working on that in partnership. And so um, I'm very excited and uh, we're excited to present this this evening. Um, this puts us in line uh, for the ribbon cutting ceremony and for construction to start on April 15th. Um, we also worked in partnership with School Site Council and the principal, Matt Levy. Um, within your packet or the agenda item, you have the um, revised uh, lease-lease agreement uh, with the uh, amount, uh, total amount not to exceed, and also you have Kent Construction document that outlines uh, by light item uh, how we arrived at that number. and. Let me scroll back up here. And we are at, excuse me. And so the, the total is $12,898,450.78. And that's 78 cents. 
So definitely uh, with the board's approval, this is an evening for celebration and we will make sure um, I will actually uh, email them right now after uh, if board approves uh, to get to work. So uh, we're very excited. Pretty exciting. <laughs> Can I have a motion? I would like to make the motion to approve this. I okay. second it. Public speakers. Is there a public speaker? Danny? No. No? Okay. Well, um, <coughs> okay. Um, I would just like to thank Willie Yahiro. He put a lot of effort into passing the measure L bond. I know uh, when he Thank talks you. about Pajaro Valley High School, um, I, I'd like to say thank you again. You know, I asked Michelle if sh uh, she can reach out to Mr. Hero and see if he can make it, because this was his project, and I would like him to be there if he can make it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Let's see. Um, okay. No, any more discussion? Is there any more discussion from the board? Okay. Um, I, I have a question. Okay. Um, so speaking of uh, Mr. Yahiro, I, I would propose that we actually name the field for him, the Willie Yahiro field, and I'm not sure how to propose that, but I, I'd like to put it on, on somebody's agenda. Mm -hmm. So we, we definitely can work with the Pajaro Valley High School um, field on that. Our, our community on that our board policy is fairly specific on how we name fields mm -hmm. and it it has to be community driven I'm not saying it can't be community driven um, I'm just saying there has to be a swelling from the community and then there has to be a, a committee that's formed that's very similar to what happened with Mr. Sutherland um, so we definitely can um, work with the principal I'd also um, if a a board member would like to help um, spearhead that too with the community because there does have to, it, it can't be a, um, it's not allowed to be an administrative um, push. It's supposed to be a swelling from the community. Um, that would be um, appreciated. Um, are all uh, the other board members going to be invited to this event? Former board board members, I'm sorry. Yeah, so we did do an electronic um, invitation to all former clo former board members that have been within the eight peer eight year time period. Um, because of the request, I, I personally invited Willie on behalf of um, of Trustee Dodge. So I personally did it in person with Willie. Um, the rest have received it um, via email, and I know um, two of them have responded to me that they appreciated the invitation. Um, so I believe that everyone um, in the recent board will be there as um, the one prior board. Okay, Danny. Oh, I think that's a great idea. Um, I would like to be the part of the committee and I think I can go out and get support and so I would like to be a part of that. Thank you. Mm. All right, are you, f no more discussion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? I didn't think so. <laughs> all right, thank, thank you. you so much, Joe. Thank and we're you. pretty, we're all very, very, very excited about that happening. <laughs> okay. Now we're doing 8.2. And that is our interim <coughs> budget report. All right, so uh, as we're aware, the, um, some positive news is we are providing a positive certification and that's the staff's recommendation uh, for the board approval. Uh, the report includes our multi-year projections. It reflects um, the LCFF and corresponding funding uh, projections and assumptions. Um, based on our FICMAT uh, state uh, calculator that we districts use to calculate the formulas. Um, and uh, the PowerPoint will just do a brief outline of our, um, our budget. And we'll get that started here. So uh, overview of the second interim, uh, including our assumptions, our updated uh, multi-year look, uh, the variance report, and next steps. 
So um, all districts, uh, as I stated, are required to do a second interim and submit periodical fiscal reports. As we know, the budget uh, district budget is a living document, and this captures a period of time throughout the year, uh, throughout our fiscal year. So that is July 1 to January 31st. Um, we have uh, districts have three uh, factors or reports that they can submit when they submit a first or second or third interim, and that's positive, which means the district can meet its uh, minimum obligations for the current and the outgoing years. Uh, qualified is can meet its current but may not meet the outgoing year, the next year. And the negative certification is you cannot meet either your current fiscal obligations or the next year. And we are positive. So that's some positive news. <coughs> um, our reporting schedules, I just wanted to remind the board, uh, is we have to adopt our budget no later than July 1. Unedited actuals, there's the fiscal activity through the end of the year by September 15th. Our uh, independent third party uh, audit is prior uh, year budget, and that is reviewed and finalized in January and February, and board approved. Our first interim by December 15th, our second interim by March 15th, and then third interim if required, and those are for districts that are either uh, qualified or negative, and we are not there, but those are submitted to the county, and those have to be resubmitted by June 30th. Um, so some of the major assumptions included in the second interim is the LCFF funded by uh, our new governor uh, from his January budget proposal. Uh, using our uh, the state uh, FICMAT calculator. Um, and that was a point in time given Governor Newsom's um, revenue and or projections and assumptions from the state. Um, we are getting some feedback now uh, for the May revise that state revenue is taking a dip as um, what was previously anticipated. We will confirm that um, by mid-May and then provide that. Uh, we're also attending the governor's workshop on May 20th. Um, our average daily attendance is a little bit over 17,207 for the current year and adjusted for declining enrollment. Uh, we mentioned that previously we had a slight decline, um, but we also have uh, it taken into consideration as we have housing development and other development within the city. So we're also using our projections and that reflects that as well. Expense is our current employee step and column movement uh, our STRS and PERS rates and rate increases, and health and welfare contributions. And we have a projected increase, and I'll have a slide that describes that. So here we have our um, general fund unrestricted multi-year. And what I wanted to point out here is that you look at our beginning balance for 1819, 33.8 million, and 1920, 25.4, and 2021, 18.6. Um, the balance uh, added plus your revenues of 194.41 in 1819 with your expenditures. The deduct of contributions, so that is taken from unrestricted and that's going into our restricted account. And so you see that as a withdrawal in our contribution line item there. And I'll explain where that goes on the next slide. But that mainly is transportation, our SELPA, and other um, contributions from the general fund. Then the increase and decrease of, of each within the multi-year and then our ending balance. Um, I think one note to point out is that our ending balance of 25.4 for 18-19 and you go straight across to 2021 to 12.25. We are spending down our uh, ending balance, fund balance for unrestricted. And then if you go through our 3% reserve that's another uh, justification that we have a positive certification that we have a minimum 3% reserve uh, for our district. And so we have the minimum 3% reserve. One thing I would like to highlight and I'm concerned about is the committed additional 3% reserve. Uh, as you see in 1819, we're at 6.82. And for 2021, I had, we had to use the additional 3% reserve to meet our financial obligations. Uh, so I just wanted to point that out. That is uh, two years out, um, and we're still some unknown factors within the state budget. Um, so there's some unknown factors there. 
The committed uh, fund balance, part of that is for something you just approved, is a PV High School uh, football field uh, for our facilities there. And so we have that 3.91 that is dedicated to that. And regarding our multi-year for restricted, um, so here uh, you'll see the contribution of the same amount that was coming from unrestricted to restricted, and that is the transfer. And that is because of the um, contribution from the general fund to restricted. Uh, so you see that direct correlation from uh, unrestricted to restricted. So beginning balance for 1819 is 6.1, our revenues of 52.8, our expenditures of 91.5. So there you see that our, our revenues are far less than our expenditures, um, and that is the funding uh, levels that we have for SELPA, funding levels that we have for transportation, and other unfunded measures that we have as a district from the state. So it has a ripple effect, and that's the impact to our district. Um, there you also see the deficit spending. We are addressing that in our restricted funds, and it is going down um, in all accordingly. Now this is the combined multi-year, so this combines both slides, so both funds unrestricted and restricted together. Um, and this shows the combined be beginning balance, our revenues, and our expenditures. Our deficit spending for 1819 is 11.8 .8 million. And then you see uh, going in the out years for 1920 at 8.42, and then 2021 at 5.91. So we are decreasing our uh, deficit spending, so that's a good thing. And we're also continuing to look at other additional internal efficiencies. Um, and also you see the commitment to the district that we're using our current funding uh, for 1819 at 28.2, and for 1920 it's 19.7, so we are using current funding uh, at our programs throughout our district uh, as we get those funds. And then the outline of our 3% reserve and our assigned fund balance that I mentioned previously for our PV high. And then you have the additional 3% reserve and the concern in 2021. Um, and you also see the restricted fund balance is decreasing as well. So we are maximizing all our funding sources that we do receive. Um, we're currently in a uh, budget uh, review process, uh, which we're looking at the various buckets of funding and just making sure that we have the various resources associated with those funding measures. So making sure that we're using the right funding for the right initiatives. Another component is, uh, is also a challenge, but we also are optimistic with the development, is the impact of declining enrollment. Um, we have, uh, we will feel the impact two years out uh, it's not an immediate uh, hit in the current year, but it's one year out where we feel the impact, the financial impact of declining enrollment. Um, and we're working on some various initiatives, and I know um, the board and our superintendent is also working um, on various initiatives in regards to attendance. And we also have an update to the board coming very soon about our Saturday Academy, our attendance recovery, and that has gone very positive. Um, and so I just want to make sure that we're focused on this area as well. This uh, graph shows our enrollment in ADA history uh, as we, uh, as a district, and looks at the comparison of our enrollment and then our students that attend on a daily basis. And so you can see that we have had a, a slight decline, and then we're projecting a slight increase uh, due to some development. Um, but we also have other areas that we're um, taking into effect. Um, and we're also working on a uh, demographic study um, to assess where our students uh, are attending uh, school sites throughout. LCFF, so as we um, was mentioned uh, last year in, uh, uh, through CSBA and um, school services, LCFF Governor Brown uh, prior to leaving office, he accomplished the, the formula to be implemented two years earlier than anticipated. And so this shows and highlights that accomplishment. Um, what does that mean for us now? Is that we are fully funded now. So we, uh, there is no additional uh, funding from LCFF uh, unless our demographics. And as you know, it's, uh, it's based on English language learners, uh, homeless, 
uh, et cetera. And so if our demographics change, then our percentages would change. But as far as the LCFF formula, it's, we're 100% funded. And that just shows the growth until now. Um, one of my other concerns that I have, um, and we made an adjustment very recently, uh, about, about a week and a half ago, was we were informed that our um, health and welfare benefits on medical only uh, will be seeing a increase within our region. So we're not gonna be the only district. The range is gonna be from six to 9% increase. Mm -hmm. And what we had anticipated was a 3% originally. And so we had to go back and uh, adjust our assumption and we raised it up to 6%. Um, the 6% uh, is at 2.5 million. I will uh, know by uh, beginning of April what that number uh, is confirmed by our, our JPA. Um, if it is a 7%, it's at 2.9. If it's 8%, it's 3.3. And if it's 9%, it's 3.7 million. And this is for medical only. This does not increase dental and vision. Um, and as soon as we get this uh, feedback and up-to-date information, we'll make sure to inform uh, superintendent, the board, and all stakeholders. <coughs> so here we outlined a similar graph that just shows the contributions that we touched on both on the unrestricted and restricted uh, previous multi-year projections. So this just shows you the exact amount for special ed, routine restricted maintenance, and other miscellaneous and then both on our unrestricted programs for transportation, and what does that look like for state and local funding? So we outlined that. One of the uh, shifts within um, the state is um, in 08, 09, districts were given the opportunity to flex um, routine restricted maintenance because of the economy and the uh, recession. So the state gave that flexibility for districts to use those funds and uh, transfer into the general fund to help offset layoffs or reductions. Now the state is re-implementing uh, routine restricted maintenance. So for 17 to uh, 2019, it was lesser than 3% of your total general fund expenditures um, and the amount deposited in 14-15 or uh, two percent of your general fund expenditures and now moving forward for 2019-20 it's three percent of your general fund expenditures and for us that's uh, 1920 that's a little bit over a million dollars and for 2021 nine hundred seventy five thousand two hundred twenty one dollars and what um, those dollars are going to be are dedicated for are for maintenance uh, it could be used for employees maintenance staff uh, equipment uh, projects, but it's the day-to-day -day operation of the district, uh, so our maintenance needs throughout the district. So we will make sure to invest those dollars throughout the district. One of the other items that I commend the staff, and I know uh, Dr. Rodriguez is very thorough with us, and is our variance report. And just making sure, and as I explained previously, is where we assume based on our assumptions on our first interim and where we land in our second interim and then our end of year and adopted budget. So the prior year adjustment to our local control funding formula, any new funding or state grants that come through from first to second interim, and that also includes donations at the local level or any other contributions. And then it also captures any expenditures and that could be from salaries, uh, a new additional staff uh, or less staff or and then also um, local, state, and federal grant entitlements. So that's also taken with into account. And I'm pleased to announce once again and uh, commend our fiscal staff that we are under 3%. Um, you will see we're pretty, really good. I think um, the one area that you see is on our revenues, which was a little bit higher, and I, I would take that any time. Uh, and then working on our expenditures, and so, um, we are definitely making some strides in the right direction. So I just want to commend the team again for having that um, best practices. So next steps, uh, we'll, uh, if board approves, we will present this to, uh, forward it to the county for review and for certification. And then we'll begin, we are beginning now to review the 1920 budget. And as I mentioned, the uh, uh, May revise, 
um, we're making sure to stay on top of the fiscal updates and making sure that we uh, get the board informed. And then um, we have the state fiscal um, finance office. They'll hold their uh, state meetings um, and inform from the May revise the impact to both K-12 education, community college, et cetera. And then we have to, the, what's the ripple effect to our school site plans and our district site budgets. Um, and then we're working on the site budget review, uh, as I mentioned, and uh, as I mentioned, the workshops as well. So the estimated actuals or 1920 uh, budget adoption will be presented in June, and we will also provide more additional information as we go in our B2B updates on Friday. So with that, my recommendation is to approve a positive certification, um, and then for the third year out, just we had to uh, make sure that we uh, keep an eye on things. Um, can I have a motion? Oh, somebody. Uh, Bill Beecher. Okay. But see, it's, I, I see a motion first. And then Good evening again. Still the motion um, first. If I were on the board, I would vote to approve uh, the second interim, but I'm not, so I can't. Uh, However, there are some minor questions that come up uh, in my limited review that I was able to do. I found it quite interesting. Enrollment's down, but revenues are going up. Hmm, how do you do that? And if you notice, in the third year, it goes up 3%. Well, that's a post-election year. That's generally when you have a recession. So I would be very nervous about the third year. Um, secondly, uh, benefits are shown to go up uh, 1.7 and 1.6 percent as we move forward in the next two years. That seems pretty low when you look at how much health is going up and STRS and PERS are continuing to go up. How can we be at 1.6, 1.7? And then a, a small thing on workers' compensation, it's 2.9 percent. Well, I looked at the Social Security data for the United States only 1.5% of the workers go out on worker compensation. We're at 2.9, almost twice as much. What? Do we really have that much? Do we have any accountability on that? How much are the real charges versus what we have in the budget? In a similar way, as I brought it up earlier, is health care costs are, you know, what are the real costs? the claims versus what we're having to pay for the premium. Then last, a small item on uh, the stuff that we never review, there's $2 million in the scholarship trust fund. And if I read it properly, there's about a quarter of a million dollars that's going out in scholarships. If it's not going out in scholarships, it's probably Joe on his next vacation. But I don't think that's the case. If it really is the case that we've got almost a quarter of a million dollars going out in scholarships, gee, why don't we talk about that at one of these board meetings? That's a heck of a good thing. Who's getting those? How's it administered? You're not in your head, and it's like, mm -hmm. hello, do you know where it's going? Thank you. <laughs> well, so I should have done, can I have a motion before? But <laughs> so can I have a motion now? Making a motion to approve second interim. Second. Okay, and now do. One more. We have Nayeli. And now Nayeli. I can have public speakers. It's okay. supposed to be now. Hi, <laughs> me again. Um, yeah, I'm not um, an ex corporate person, but um, I'm just a used to be math teacher. Uh, I was looking at your original budget from that you approved in the summertime, and I know that when variances are done, they look at the you know first interim variance to second inter interim, you know the variance between those two. But um, as the revenue has increased, so has your proposed um, or the budgeted expenditures. So um, it just almost seems like on purpose there is this, like, let's put more money in books and supplies. And um, 
spend more on services and other operating costs. So that's something that we look at. And then something I just wanted to bring up, um, because a lot of times, especially when we go into negotiations and we talk about wages <clears throat> and health and welfare benefits, uh, teachers and well, just educators, people that work in the classroom with students are not as well respected or valued. Um, and just for the certificated people that we, the non-management certificated people that we represent, we only comprise about 33% or 36% this year of the budget. So that's just in salaries. Um, back in 2013-14, it was 40% and we were solvent. And then it continued that our percentages went down as far as our our, our, our salaries, these are based on unaudited actuals, um, have gone down progressively. So in 1415, it went from 34 to 33% for certificated non-management, non the people that we represent. Um, and then, so now, uh, just for compare, using these interim numbers, we're at 32%. So from 2013 to now, we have about $46 million more in revenues, but our uh, impact on the fund in, in salaries is going down. Um, so when it comes to the budgets, I hope that you guys can question how money is being used in other areas outside of salaries and, and benefits. Thank you. Okay, discussion from the board. No, I, I, I okay, go ahead. Joe, and maybe Helen. Joe, you have to keep standing up here. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know if there was another public, sorry. <clears throat> so I know that, um, so the, um, the new maintenance money, that's exciting because for the eight years that I've sat here, that's we haven't had that. Correct. It's been very, very hard to run a district without being able to do just regular maintenance. So I like that. That's great. Um, so we have a charter school that was granted, which I understood we were going to lose about $2 million or something like the first year. Approximately. Is that in this budget? Because I didn't see that in the slides as being something that was, yeah, w did I miss it? Okay. So yes, it's, it's included in that. Um, and then that is still an assumption. Um, the new um, charter uh, navigator is projecting 180, I believe it was 183 enrollment approximately. And we're anticipating it to be a lot, uh, about 120. Um, but we'll know <coughs> when the enrollment comes through. Um, and so and other assumption is we're still trying to confirm is the location so that just is another factor but that's included within the multi-year okay um it, and so our salary is really 32 percent of our budget only no they're approximately total salary and benefits as I, that's what i want to know yeah, okay. so total, this, but i'm talking about salary so is salary only 32 percent no it's total about 90 percent of our budget salary. but you're talking salary about with benefits. benefits i want to know exactly what the percentage is for salary we can break that down and if you don't have it now that's okay i i, I can we can get it in a b2b but what i do know what i'm trying to get at is is i know that our um, health and welfare benefits are a ginormous mm -hmm. portion of our budget so you have to look at the total compensation I know that we're paying enormous amounts to CalPERS and CalSTRS for retirement, mm -hmm. and that has just kept going up, 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 and up. So I'd like you to sort of tease out, like, how much that's, that's gone up. Yeah, and the, the salary piece is approximately 52%, approximately. Very well, we, rough. Report was right. And then as far as the impact, we will come back, and I know we have the impact of the either six to nine percent increase on the medical we also will have an update as soon as possible what that multi-year impact is and so we're working on that as well we i just um saw a video by robert um reich who's you, you know he is he's a professor at berkeley 
um, about the Blue Cross and Blue Shield, Blue Cross Anthem and Blue Shield raked in four point or four billion dollars last year in profit. Um, so th there should be no raising of health and welfare. I mean, there should be no raising of health benefits when we've got these giant corporations making so much um, off of its membership. So, um, so I don't know why. Why do you, why do they think that it's going to go up six to nine percent this year? Where I are we getting those figures, and how are they basing those? I think well, the prior year I think we were a little bit over like 0.8 uh, percent. <laughs> so we really enjoyed not a big increase the previous year. Um, it fluctuates, um, and I think it's the market um, that kind of dictates that. Um, and specific to our region, we're not the so being part of the JPA, we're, we're a member district, right. so we're not alone. So we pool with other districts um, and our membership, uh, which includes all employees, and we try to shop around for the best rate. And so that, that anticipated increase is for all the districts in our region. Um, so we're going to be continue to ask questions like what are the main factors that led to that, um, but that's the information we were provided. So our, our salaries and our benefits with all of our teachers and staff make up what how much of our budget right. and I really like yeah. having those pie charts that you guys have done okay. in the past because it makes it very crystal clear for we the usually, lay person yeah. we <laughs> usually do those at budget time but we can yeah. add them to the every other time we can but it's about 85 to 87 percent so of our yeah. total budget we're spending approximately mm -hmm. 85 to 87 mm -hmm. percent on our people yes great thank you when when they were saying that it's it's gone down every year, um, Nellie, what exactly is she? Does she mean exact? I mean, I by that. Well, we're gonna have to. I'm gonna have to look into that a little bit more. But yeah, I'm, I'm assuming it's um, based by certificated staff. That's what I heard. Yeah, uh, from that comment. But I'll have to look a little bit deeper specifically to that. Yeah, and. I was just saying, I mean, obviously, so our declining enrollment has a lot to do with Navigator. I mean, that's, you know, when you talk about, put that thing up about declining enrollment. The, um, current, the current decline is our current declining enrollment uh, for this year. The future outgoing years, it's a combination of both. It's both uh, a slight increase of enrollment, but also a decline because of uh, the Navigator. Yeah, so I'm just saying they're not completely 100% of it, but they are a big part a of our declining enrollment Correct. navigator yeah so I have a question um, so we haven't been investing back in our schools um, and I think I just want to get to the bottom of the point that Nelly um, just mentioned is why are we seeing those increases in in expenditures where are those, uh, where are those exp additional expenditures going? Where is that additional money going? Is it because we have um, brought in initiatives such as uh, Footsteps to Brilliance? Is it because we are doing um, so much other things within the classroom that those expenditures are increasing? Or is it related to something completely different? Uh, there's numerous uh, initiatives, but I'll have our superintendent uh respond to that sure so the reason why for the most part the revenues and expenditures are going up comparatively is exactly that either the grants that we're receiving we are expending so for example the 1.2 million that we just received for the um, low performing block grant mm -hmm. we have now encumbered right because right. what we were required to do from the state is have that plan in place and so with all of the grants that we receive, and remember, we're pulling in now, we're pulling in two to three million dollars worth of grants um, pretty consistently. Um, we just received word today that we're in the final phase for the, uh, for the parent involvement um, grant that we applied for. Um, but again, that would be another million dollars we would receive, but it would go out immediately because part of the grants or the requirements of these extra monies that we're receiving is that we correspond them. Um, also, some of our expenditures are going out because we had the 19 million that we had put aside. Right. Um, there was about 10 million which was put towards facilities. That's right. And so 3 million of that is, well, 3.9 is mm -hmm. PBHS. 
right? And so that's now going to happen, so that money is being expended out. Um, but a lot of the money, when the revenues are coming up, they are proportionately... Right. Um, and I think that's what I want to see moving forward in the presentations. The reason why I ask that question is because I want to make sure that we're transparent. Uh, when we do see uh, those additional revenues come into to the district, where we're actually spending those. And I just wanted to to clarify that just for public sake too, because mm -hmm. we're investing our dollars not on giving management increases, right? Uh, but actually investing them back in the classroom. Correct. Um, I do have one question. So aside from Saturday um, Academy, what other initiatives are we currently working on to increase enrollment? So one of the uh, other items that we're looking at um, and for Superintendent Rodriguez is uh, pilot to scale. Uh, we're currently reviewing our uh, messaging system to parents, um, mm -hmm. but we're still in the preliminary stages of reviewing that. Um, but that is something that we're looking at as a district. Um, right now we have an all call um, uh, to parents to give notifications for school events or school um, uh, announcements but what would it look like if we did text messaging and mm -hmm. or other um, uh, proactive um, information items to increase our average daily attendance. So that's one um, mm -hmm. component. Um, another area that we work very hard, hard on in partnership with uh, our student services, uh, Suzanne and um, with Kristen, our assistant super secondary and uh, Lisa Gary on the assistant soup uh, for elementary is uh, finalizing our enrollment packet. Um, and I think we shared with the board previously is um, aligning our parent enrollment packet mm -hmm. to making sure that it's easy to use and easy to fill out. So we have the enrollment and the necessary documents included in there that are mandatory. Uh, so that's another area to increase our attendance, but also uh, enrollment at the site specific. So where they want um, to be enrolled at. And so the enrollment process, trying to smooth that out as well. Mm -hmm. so Is that available now electronically? We are uh, looking at that as well. We need to. So <laughs> uh, we're looking at those options as well. Also, it hasn't been solidified yet, but we're hopefully going to be meeting on the 28th where we're going to decide through the LMI initiative what will be the first initiative that we're going to work on jointly with PVFT, CSCA, and PVUSD. So that hasn't been solidified yet. However, one of the items that we have discussed, one of the initiatives, mm -hmm. is next year doing an attendance campaign because it's something that every single employee in the organization um, can not only influence but also benefit from. Um, and so that would that most likely will be our theme next year. So this year is be a kind of more empathetic you. We're not necessarily dropping that completely off, but we're going to be mm -hmm. doing having a focus on attendance um, because for every student, every time that that percentage goes up, um, then that's additional revenue for the district. Okay, and then for summer, uh, we receive ADA funding for that, right? Correct. Okay. So, is there any way that we can utilize that? So, for example, expanding summer school, uh, but making it more of a STEAM-related summer academy or, um, you know, something that's very much of interest within the community, you know, where we can not only uh, enroll students who need to attend summer school for whatever reason, but to keep our students engaged in something productive throughout the summer and something that they're going to enjoy. So um, hopefully looking into that. Yes, um, and I just wanted to clarify, for the Saturday Academy, we do get uh, ADA recovery. For summer school, we do not. Mm, summer school okay. is an unfunded, or it's funded a different uh, way. But we also, on the um, looking at opportunities, how to package our Saturday Academy uh, so that it complements our, our main, our core program at the site, so that's also being looked at as well. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Can we make it summer school that, I mean, is it, can, can we make summer school that everyone can go or just need students that need to go, go to summer school? I was going to ask you that then, Michelle. Um, well, there, um, we try to make sure that every spot is filled. Um, so one thing I know that we, that Carol Ortiz does a really good job of is ensuring that 
when they do have any additional space, then we call off of the waiting list. Um, and so um, we want to ensure that every space that we have is, is filled. Um, for the most part, we do not have additional students that are wanting the program that are not receiving it. So, Dr. Rodriguez, you mentioned uh, the labor management initiative, and so with the, the partnership, and ultimately we as, you know, board members are agents of the state. You know, how we divvy up the pie of, of the budget is ultimately, the, the size of that pie is dependent on what comes from the state. Perhaps the labor management partnership might be an opportunity to, to partner in advocating with our, our state legislators on increasing that pie. Good evening, Joe. Um, I think most of my questions got um, answered by Trustee to surface questions, particularly in relation to Navigator and whether that's been put into the consideration of the budget with a declining enrollment for our district. Um, and in regards to the one public comment with regards to revenues going up um, projected in the 20, I think that was the 2019-2020. Um, you know, and the expenditures going up, I, I mean, being um, a pretty astute business owner myself, I know that, the, you know, they kind of go hand in hand. When revenues go up, expenditures typically go up. So, do, I mean, do you have any further explanation that you would like to elaborate on that for the public? No, I, I think uh, uh, you said it well. Um, with increased revenue, we have increased investments throughout our district, both at the site level and uh, throughout programs. We do uh, have and commend our, our grant writer. We've done an amazing job of increasing uh, our awards of grant dollars. Some of those grant uh, grants are no match. Some of them require a match, 50 cents on the dollar or dollar to dollar. So that is varies, but we are increasing those, um, those grant amounts as well. So, um, so that's in overall how we uh, approach. I, I appreciate your elaboration on that. Um, I, I would just, you know, I think it's, <laughs> You might see it as a bit out of order, President Trustee Osmondson, but I'd just like to comment, and it's been brought to my attention previous, and it actually came to point right um, earlier after Joe got done with the presentation. Um, you're calling for motions right after a presentation and a second before we're hearing public comment or before the board is making any comment. So for the public, that sets an image that we as board members have come to this dais with a precept in our head of how we're gonna vote before hearing the public's comment or before hearing our colleagues discuss it. I know it was brought to your attention, I think it was last month at the February 13th meeting by Trustee Orozco. I'd looked at her and questioned it because since I've been here under President Trustee DeSerpa when she was the former president and even under past president, um, former Trustee DeRose, we never called for a motion and a second before hearing the public's comment and hearing the comment before the, about, from the board because you're making a precept that there is already a decision in mind made without that. And we need to remind ourselves that we, us seven sitting here, are publicly elected officials by our constituents. This is not our money. These are not our funds. This is the community's funds. We represent these people. We are just mere stewards of them. So I think I'd like to ask you to rethink how you're running these meetings. Let's hear the public comment. Let's hear board comment before we make a motion and before we make a second. It is really lacking transparency and I don't support this going forward. Thank you. So as part of the preparation for the board meetings, we did, um, so there isn't supposed to be a second, we did contact legal counsel and when we do the Brown Act um, training, it will be brought forward. The, the, the order is supposed to be a motion, original motion, so that you can open up the item. Um, you're not supposed to do a second until after the fact, so it is, a motion and the other. It was brought up. I did double check um, with Lozano and Smith. Um, we can turn it back the way that it was before. Um, 
but technically it's supposed to be a motion to open up the item. Then there's the public comment, the district comment, and then there's the second, and then there's the vote. Um, so it's, we can take it back, but that was the order in which we were given when we started to do um, it in writing. So we, we have now, the meeting is, is, is prepared. Um, and so because of that, that's, that's the reason. So we're not supposed to be doing a second in before everything else, but we are supposed to be doing the motion to open up the item. So Michelle, I, I'm, I'm gonna just chime back in on this. You know, I, I mean, me, myself, I, I have lived in this community for over 30 years. I have been to a multitude of school board meetings, not only for this district, others, city council meetings, county supervisors meetings, I have never seen it done that way. It had not been done that way until tr um, Trustee Osmondson took over. I'm understanding what you're saying. I'm asking you to hear what I'm saying. It really lacks transparency when you put a motion on the floor because it's like a decision's already been made. We're not hearing the public's comment. This is, yes, the school district's business, but it is the public's business. It is their money, their funding. It's not ours solely, so I really, would encourage we get back to some more transparency and we not have the first and the second. We hear public comment, have the board dialogue, and then make a motion. Okay. Um, can I just add to that really quick? Um, I would agree with that uh, for the, the reasons that she stated. Um, but also, I think you're referring to uh, the guidance that we received from Robert's Rules, right? Robert's Rules of Orders. I don't believe that this board has officially adopted the robber's rules of order, um, we have not, right? So um, so I think I like the old way of doing things too. I think it allows us to really reflect on what we're hearing from the public, on what we're hearing from board members before the notion of, of making a decision um, is made. You know, and I would just chime back to support Maria and that that you know it is for us seven as board members to declare our procedures as a collective body so if we say we want to hear the presentation we want to hear the public comment we want to hear our colleagues comment before a motion is made that's for us seven to decide because we decide the procedures of these board meetings not anyone else so just to support that thank you trustee Orozco Um, I would like to thank um, thank your team for this um, second interim report. It's very, very, it, it appears very clean and very tight. I feel like we've gotten, you guys have gone through everything with a fine tooth comb and gotten it, you know, very precise. So, and I know that was a lot of work. So thank you, Helen. Thank you. Yeah. I will second. There was a. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Aye. Okay. Motion carries. Um, motion carries six. No, was it? Oh, she's not here. Okay. It's. Um, Five one one. No. Now. No. Just say please keep things first and always right now. No, right now. Right. No. No second. Right. So we have to wait on the seconds. We're gonna. I'm gonna keep doing this right now, but we can wait on the seconds. We have to wait on the seconds. <laughs> okay. Eight point three. Approve memorandum of understanding with PVFT regarding professional growth opportunities in math and science with Jonah Killeen. Take a little longer. I think Joe is a little taller than me, so I need to adjust. <laughs> um, thank you, President Osmondson, Board Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez, 
for your review is the resubmission of the MOU with PBFT regarding professional growth opportunities in math and science. And as per PBFT President Francisco Rodriguez said, this is our marathon MOU because it was several weeks in the making. Um, and I'd like to give a shout out to our directors, Allison Yazawa and Clint, Clint Rucker, as well as our PBFT compatriots, President Rodriguez, Sarah Henney, and Chief Negotiator Nellie Boggs, as we are proud of the combined hard work that we did. And they're also going to be available to help me answer your questions. Um, the main revisions for the MOU include, um, especially it was important for us to um, take into consideration the board recommendations. So the main revisions include the reimbursements are available only to employees who've been in the district and have been at least dedicated employees of the district for at least two years. Uh, the second one is there is a monetary limit to the reimbursements and it's paid in installments. The second half of the reimbursement shall be made at the start of the next school year provided the employee is still continuing in the position requiring a math or science credential. And um, to further increase our pool of math and science teachers, um, this was the new addition. There is the additional option of reimbursement for passage of a state approved examination provided at the start of the first year uh, for the teacher in a math or science position. Um, we will continue to uh, recruit early as we have done um, to get the best and the brightest and um, with early postings on EdJoin, going to job fairs, and we're also um, going to continue to promote the negotiated uh, signing bonus for these hard to fill positions as in science, math, and special education. Thank you so much. they're going to answer your questions. <laughs> okay, because I'm going to do I have a motion but not second. So can I have a motion? No second. Make a motion to approve. Okay, any public speakers? No? Any discussion from the board? Um, I do have just a comment. I just want to appreciate the fact that you took this item back and you did some homework and I think now it addresses um, uh, the concerns that we brought to the table a couple meetings ago or less month sometime last month so thank, thank you for doing that so I'm, I'll be supporting this tonight any other discussion from the board questions Georgia I, I'm sorry Chana could you clarify again I'm sorry about the um, so I get that while they're employed we're obviously paying but what is the time frame we're asking them to stay employed once it's completed so um, in the MOU uh, eligible employees who wish to participate in the benefit, they need to submit proof of the tuition amount to the district with th uh, within three months of starting the coursework. Mm -hmm. And the district shall reimburse the employee one half of the tuition allocation um, upon completion of the coursework required for a math and science credential. The second half of the reimbursement shall be made at the start of the next school year provided the employee is still in that um, position requiring a math or science credential. And we also placed a monetary, um, monetary limit on the reimbursements. Um, the district will accept six eligible employees for reimbursement of tuition each year. But how so, long? So she wants to know how uh, long. There, so they, right, so the one half while they're in it, no, I'm, ju I'm just going to repeat what you said sure, sure. and tell me if I didn't hear you correctly. The one half they're going to get while they're in it, while yes. they're an employee. And that the next school year when it starts, they're going to get that full second half payment at the beginning of that school year, at during throughout that school year, over the course of one school year, over the course of two, three, four, five school years. Please explain that. So if they get it at the beginning of the school year, they're contracted with us, so they have to remain with us for that one year. For that at least that one so year. So it's only one year. No. It's yes, on the second It's it's 2 years. Okay, granted that while they're an employee, right? While they're an employee, they're going to get the one half. That's a given. I understand that. Then they complete it. And then at the beginning of the next school year, while they're and they have to work for one year, they're going to get the full second half reimbursement. So they have to be an employee with I'm Allison Zell, I'm the director <laughs> of, so they have to be an employee with us to even qualify for, for two years first. Sure, I got that. Uh, okay, they won't receive payment until they successfully complete, complete. the program. They'll that get the one half payment. They won't begin payment, correct. 
the the one half payment correct. they'll get in mm -hmm. the year that they're in it. Once they've completed the program, the first year that they are now a teacher in that subject in a math or science, they will receive one half of their reimbursement. So the program's completed, they're mm -hmm. done. Mm -hmm. So let's just take, I'm an employee and I'm doing that this year. Mm -hmm. I'm done by the end of this school year. Okay. And next school year, so I don't get my first one half payment till the beginning of 2019. Ni the 1920 school 1920, year. 1920. Mm -hmm. And I get my next payment, the 20 2021. 2021. Granted that you are still in a math or science position. Okay. So then it does take two, two full effective Correct. years, okay, that Correct. they have to stay committed beyond being out of the program. Correct. Yes. Thank you. That was what I really needed for. See why it took us so long I, to I, work I, it all I out. didn't know if I wasn't asking the question right. Or no, you were. I was just. Uh, you know. Oh, thank you. You have answered my question, though. Thank you. Just again, Allison. Okay, are we done? So, w you know, with yeah, that, I, I do appreciate that. I think um, I agree with Maria. That got us somewhere. I think I would have liked to seen it be three years, but I'll accept mm -hmm. the two years. So, you know, I think it's just more of a real world application. Yes. Okay, so I do appreciate the work on that. Thank you for doing the work and bringing it back to us. Thank you. So, um, so five thousand dollars per employee for a program. The tuition for a program at the minimum is like eight thousand dollars a year, right? Because CSU, that's the tuition, yes. right? For, so it doesn't. We, we're not paying for the whole program. We're paying. We're just reimbursing a portion. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Let's get some math and science teachers. Yes, hopefully. <laughs> Does the city want to say anything, uh, Francisco? Um, it's just that um, the, the point was that uh, there are already existing employees with us with that and they all, they all likely already have either a preliminary or maybe even a clear credential. So to get the math or science, it won't, it, it won't be like they have to do the teacher training piece of it all over again. Okay, now I'm asking for a second. That's how we're supposed to be doing it. <laughs> second the motion. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now I'm gonna call for a vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? <clears throat> okay, now I'm gonna approve salary schedule career technical education program teacher and, and this report will be by you. Yes. <laughs> Jonah. Um, thank thank you. you, President Osmondson, Board Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. Um, this is the marathon salary schedule um, from, as PVFT President Francisco would say. Um, towards a goal of career and uh, college and career readiness for all students, PBUSD will be implementing its own career technical education pilot program um, starting July 1st, uh, 2009, and no later than June 30th, 2021. And as per the MOU, both PVFT and our district wanted to ensure that the positions for the CTA uh, services are in the bargaining unit and provides a fair, appropriate, and competitive salary schedule for CTE teachers hired for these positions. Both parties agree that if CTE services are not extended after the pilot, PBUSD may contract out for CTE services. And this was developed um, in close uh, collaboration with PVFT and the proposed salary schedule takes into account both industry experience, teaching experience in conjunction with education of the individual and is presented for your consideration. All right, so <laughs> I'm gonna ask for a motion, not a second. <laughs> okay. Any public speakers? See any? Any discussion from the board? Um. <laughs> Let's see. Let's see what I want to say. Schedule. Um. Current proof. I'm just wanting to see. Let's see. Something I wanted to say. I was thinking, but maybe I can't think of what it is. <coughs> um. Well, uh, I'll go ahead and ask this one. So we are, go ahead and tell us again how much we are going to save from the County Office of Education in order to do this. 
So the county was going to charge us a little bit over $600,000 in order to be able to um, manage, um, the, manage the, the program. So we already were paying for the teachers. Um, we were basically reimbursing um, the county back the money. So what we are doing in turn is we are we do we will now have a coordinator of CTE which will cost us with benefits and all of that approximately a hundred and forty thousand um, dollars, which means we will be saving approximately four hundred and sixty thousand dollars, which can be reinvested back into our CTE programs. A year we're going to be a doing. year. Yeah. Sounds good. <laughs> okay. No, no speakers or anything. Um, now, can I have a second? Yeah, second. <laughs> second. Okay, I will call for a vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Yeah. So, so this is... So this is 8.5, approved resolution number 181929, recognizing April as National Bilingual Multilingual Learner, Learner Advocacy Month. Thank you. Good Report evening. by Lisa Aguirre. Thank you. Good evening, President Osmondson, Board of <laughs> Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. The mission of Global California 2030 is to equip students with world language skills to better appreciate and more fully engage with the rich and diverse mixtures of cultures, heritage, and languages found in California and throughout the world, while also preparing them to succeed in the global economy. To that end, PVUSD is strengthening our bilingual programs through the revision of our EL Master Plan and expanding the dual language immersion programs offered to, offered to increase the number of students receiving the state seal of biliteracy and graduating a biliterate or multiliterate student prepared for global citizenship. Before you is resolution number 18, 1929, recognizing April 2019 as National Bilingual Multilingual Learner Advocacy Month. Conce concede, sorry, a little nervous. Considerado ando que el Distrito Escolar Unificado de Pajaro Valley se enorgullece de unirse a las instituciones educativas de todo el país el reconocer el mes de abril de 2019 como el mes nacional de apoyo al estudiante bilingües multilingües. Whereas National Bilingual Multilingual Learner Advocacy Month is aligned to the mission of Global California 2030, which is to equip students with the world language skills to better appreciate and more fully engage with the diverse mix of cultures, heritage, and languages found in California and the world. Whereas National Bilingual Multilingual Advocacy Month recognizes that bilingual multilingual learners are one of the fastest growing student populations in US schools, that this group of students brings multiple assets to schools and adds to the rich diversity among students. And whereas National Bilingual Multilingual Learner Advocacy Month is an opportunity to draw attention to the persistent gap between bilingual multilingual learners and native English speaking students, and whereas National Bilingual Multilingual Learner Advocacy Month calls on stakeholders at all levels to examine the diverse needs of bilingual multilingual learners and to build an inclusive and respectful culture, and whereas National Bilingual Multilingual Learner Advocacy Month highlights a commitment to ensure educational equity and access leading th these learners to thrive academically and become protective, biliterate, multiliterate global citizens, and whereas National Bilingual Multilingual Learner Advocacy Month calls for the need to prepare highly qualified bilingual educators in all disciplines to address the unique needs of our students in the diverse settings. Whereas the month calls for the need to engage parents and guardians of bilingual multilingual learners in their students' educational journey. And whereas National Bilingual Multilingual Learner Advocacy Month recognizes the significant languages and cultural assets that bilingual, multilingual learners bring to schools. Mm -hmm. Ahora, por lo, lo tanto, se resuelve que el Distrito Escolar Unificado de Pajaro Valley está comprometido a fortalecer 
la educación bilingüe al actualizar lizar nuestro plan maestro de aprendices de inglés para mejorar la articulación de nuestros modelos de instrucción, nuestro compr compromiso de valorar los idiomas y apoyar a todos los estudiantes para que alcancen su mayor, mayor potencial. Pues resuelve que el Distrito Escolar Unificado de Pajaro Valley está comprometido a fortalecer la educación bilingüe medi mediante la expansión de las opciones de educación de inmersión dual en español dentro de nuestro distrito. Resuelve de que el Distrito Escolar Unificado de Pajaro Valley proclama el mes de abril de 2019 como el mes nacional de promoción de estudiantes bilingües, multilingües y continúa fortaleciendo nuestra educación y enfoque en los estudiantes bilingües, multilingües. multilingües. There you go. Good for you. That's <laughs> good for you. Hopefully that the resolution is adopted. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Can I have a motion to switch? I would be very proud to make a motion to approve this resolution tonight. Okay, any public speakers? No. Any discussion from the board? <laughs> it's just a wonderful resolution. <laughs> it's wonderful. Okay. You did a great job, Lisa. And I saw the superintendent smiling at you. I think she was sweetly, um, you know, pleased with your presentation. <laughs> so you and got her kudos while you were looking down. I saw and that. And your efforts of being bilingual. <laughs> and your efforts of being bilingual. Great job. <laughs> Great job. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, now can I have a second? I'll second. All right. I'll call for a vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> Opposed? <laughs> Unanimous accepted 6-0, or whatever it is. OK. 8.6, this is another resolution, lots of resolutions. 181931 of declaring support for April as National Child Abuse Prevention Month. Suzanne Smith. Board members, thank you for considering um, April as National Child Abuse Prevention Month. Resolution number 181931. Whereas, whereas child safety is the most utmost importance, and whereas child abuse and neglect is an important societal concern that may affect the long-term health and well-being of not only the children, but also the adults they become. And whereas safe, stable, and nurturing relationships and communities can break the cycle of abuse and maltreatment. And whereas child abuse prevention requires a coordinated and comprehensive response by all systems supporting children, youth and families, and whereas everyone has a stake in ensuring that children have access to the resources and supports that they need to be safe, healthy, and successful, and whereas suspected child abuse or neglect must immediately be reported to appropriate law enforcement authorities, and whereas we have identified child safety and family services to be a priority and hereby declare April as Child Abuse Prevention Month. All right. <laughs> Okay, can I have a motion? I'll make a motion to support this resolution <laughs> against child abuse. I was a former child welfare social worker. It is the hardest job there is on the face mm -hmm. of the planet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I think we should all just support this and thank you for bringing <laughs> it forward. <laughs> thank you. Okay, no public speakers. Any discussion from the board on this one? Pretty obvious one. This one's kind of an obvious one. <laughs> okay, now can I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Six zero. Thank you very much. Now we're going to have 
a third resolution. <laughs> this one's a really great one too. Really great one. This is resolution 181926, resolution in support of HR 1384, the Medicare for All Act of 2019 that would establish a comprehensive universal single payer health care coverage program and a health care cost control program by Dr. Rodriguez. So I just get the benefit of introducing the item. So one thing I know that this board takes pride in is um, is not only influencing um, local um, local policies and um, and efforts, but also on a state and national level as well. And so um, Trustee Holm um, did all the work, and yeah. um, we so appreciate her expertise in this area. Yes. So Trustee Holm. Why don't Thank you go ahead and do it? You, <laughs> you should do it. <laughs> so Dr. Rodriguez, uh, President Osmondson, fellow members of the board and members of the public, thank you for um, letting me take time to consider this resolution in support of H.R. 1384, uh, the Medicare for All Act of 2019. I come from this perspective of health care as a human right. There is overwhelming evidence that health and education are inextricable factors in a person's chances of success in life. The two influence one another, and our current system does not support optimal health. No one should lose life or limb because of an, a lack of ability to pay for their health care. So I want to illustrate uh, some of the scope of the issue. Um, you know, currently, you know, on the, the left of the graph there is, is per capita spending annually for other industrialized nations in the world. Um, Switzerland is at about 6,000. You know, Mexico is at, at the bottom at about 1,000 per capita annually. Life expectancies are on the right. To get a sense of what we're dealing with, you might notice if you can see the tiny, tiny print, the United States is not in there. We have to zoom out. The United, Spa the United States spends all, you know, over 9,000 per capita annually. Our life expectancy is lower. The thinness of the line indicates how much we're actually spending, you know, how much we're utilizing our health care. We're utilizing it less. We're spending more. We're having poorer outcomes. And that number has actually risen. It's closer to 11,000 as of this year. The impact on PVUSD of our current system, uh, the current uh, health care benefits is, you know, over $49 million annually. We're, we, as we spoke about earlier, we're expecting to see that increase of 6 to 9 percent. And the cost to the district could rise to, you know, just over, you know, 52 million to just, you know, just shy of 54 million. The impact on our communities is that we've got millions of people who have no coverage at all. We have 20 percent of people under the age of 65 who have difficulties paying for their bills. And more than 66 percent of insured people are left with a bill for out-of-network services where they weren't aware that their provider wasn't in network. And then, you know, health care bills are one of the number one reason for bankruptcies in our country. What H.R. 1384 does, it's comprehensive, including medical, mental, dental, vision, and long-term care. The potential financial benefits to the district are, you know, cost savings. We hear about, you know, oh, single payer, it's so expensive. Yes, it's expensive. And, you know, the, their uh, cost uh, is estimated at $32 trillion over 10 years. That's a big number. Consider that what we are currently spending is $3.5 trillion annually right now. So what we're looking at by moving to this system nationally is a savings of about 8.5 percent. Even if, you know, our, the savings to our district were proportional, we're looking at a savings of $3 million annually at a minimum and more when you consider in, you know, price negotiation for drug costs and, and other issues. The potential human benefits to PVSD are early intervention for health issues, mental and physical, for students and staff. That could lead to increased high school graduation rates because the early intervention is key. It could lead to increased average daily attendance, increased job satisfaction for staff, and then it gives us opportunities to negotiate funding for other much needed programs and salary increases, you know, in the district. And I zoomed through that because I want to talk about the resolution, but there's many, many opportunities for further research, and this is the documentation that I use to prepare this uh, presentation. And so thank you for your time and attention. So can I, shall I go ahead and read the resolution? Go ahead and read All it. All right. Yeah. So 
So resolution in support of H.R. 1384, the Medicare for All Act of 2019, that would establish a comprehensive universal single-payer health care coverage program and a health care cost control measure. Um, whereas everyone should have a right to health care, and whereas the Federal Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, PPACA, brought many improvements in health care and health care coverage, it still leaves many people in the United States of America without coverage or with inadequate coverage. And whereas individuals, employers, and taxpayers have experienced a rise in the cost of health care and health care coverage in recent years, including rising premiums, deductibles, and copays, as well as restricted provider networks and high out of network charges. And whereas the annual cost of Pajaro Valley Unified School District for health care benefits is annually $49.5 million and expected to rise. And whereas freeing the funds utilized for health care benefits would allow the district to negotiate options like student centered interventions, enrichments and supports, increased compensation, and subsidized housing. And whereas students who have access to consistent health care are more likely to achieve academic success. And in turn, those with higher academic achievement tend to have lo better long term health outcomes. And whereas students who have access to regular health services have increased attendance rates, which in turn increases funds available to the district. And whereas H.R. 1384 would establish an improved Medicare for All insurance program with comprehensive care and health care cost control measures. And whereas H.R. 1384 would provide consistent coverage rather than being based on a person's changing income or employment status. And whereas H.R. 1384 would eliminate out of control copays and high deductibles and reduce insurance company waste and duplication. And whereas H.R. 1384 would give patients the freedom to choose their doctor and would manage prescription drug costs, therefore be it resolved that the Pajaro Valley Unified School District will continue to provide health-related wraparound services such as Salud Para La Gente school-based clinics and work with Alliance for a Healthier Generation uh, with the 10 pilot schools to support the health of our students and staff. Be it further resolved that PVSD through the Healthy Start program will continue to provide dental and medical outreach, referral placements, parent education, transportation to services, and promote injury prevention measures to improve the health of our students. Now be it resolved by the Pajaro Valley Unified School District that we endorse HR 1384. Thank you for your consideration. It's a really exciting resolution. Okay, can I have a motion? Yeah, make a motion. You should motion. <laughs> I'll second that motion. <laughs> no, you can't second it yet. Remember? Oh, that's true. <laughs> I thought we were just going to vote. Is it? Okay, no Sorry. public speakers. No. Any discussion from the board? Everybody's happy with it, I'm sure. Okay, now a second. Go ahead and second. I'd like to second the motion. <laughs> okay, I'll vote for all those in favor. Aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Okay. It's 511, right? 511. Okay, now I'm going to do, um, I forgot what I am, 8.8, <laughs> World history curriculum adoption and report will be presented by Susan Perez and also oh. okay oh this is new is it on yes Okay, good evening, President Osmondson, members of the board, Dr. Rodriguez. Um, very excited to be back up here again after the years that we waited and waited for new materials. Um, the last couple years we've been coming quite regularly with um, adoption recommendations. And this evening um, I would like to present um, Claudia Monjaras, who is our coordinator for English Language Arts and History Social Science to share with you the process that um, she has helped facilitate with our 10th grade um, history social science teachers to adopt new materials. And they are bringing forth their recommendation after going through the process. So um, as she goes through this, I will begin to pass around a sample of the materials that our teachers are requesting that you approve for adoption for this particular course.
Okay, good evening. Um, so, okay, good morning, Karen, or good evening, Karen. Um, my name is Claudia Mojaras, um, and I'm going to be, um, like Susan said, talking about the uh, world history recommendation that the uh, teachers are wanting to put forward. So um, we started the process in spring 2018, doing the publisher's fair, inviting teachers to come and um, review the materials. There were several of them that they could uh, look at. They ended up putting two of them forward, um, and I'll point those out in just a minute. Then in December of uh, 2018, we brought the teachers together. We invited all 10th grade world history teachers to come from the three um, high schools, comprehensive high schools. And um, we had eight of the teachers show up, and all three of the comprehensives were represented. Um, and at that time, that's when we actually reviewed the materials, and they uh, voted on which one they wanted at that point. And then we've been in contact with the publisher about getting some training set up. That way, implementation would start in fall of 2019. So the two materials that they looked at were uh, the one on the left, which is TCI History Alive, and then the one on the right, which was the McGraw-Hill Impact. And we spent some time um, looking through those. There were um, seven basic key areas that we looked through and had them work in groups and um, analyze both of the curricula. And the um, TCI one was the one that got the slightly higher numbers. And so that's what they decided. Now, in looking at both of these, um, they did note that there were some gaps that they wanted to um, increase uh, the instructional rigor for students. And so an additional recommendation was to not just go with TCI. Um, the teachers also requested that we use uh, DBQ materials, which I'll talk about in just a second. Um, that's the big green binder. Um, we have the purple one here. This is also world history stuff. Uh, but this is actually a uh, program that is basically literacy through content. And it's a writing program. And it does offer the students an op opportunity to practice argumentative writing um, based on multiple so uh, sources of evidence and, and fill the gaps that we felt both of the other programs, their other options were um, had. So uh, what they are recommending is that, um, recommends by majority, that the PBSD School Board approve TCI's History Alive World Connections supplemented with DBQ project as the core history social studies instructional materials for the beginning of the 2019-2020 school year for an eight-year adoption. I'll move. Sorry, I got caught reading a text. That's okay. <laughs> So um, historically, for those of us that are my age and probably from the 40s up, um, there was a lot of history that kind of that we had to consume that only um, came from a male perspective. It was all about wars and who conquered who. Does this particular version have any female mm -hmm. voice in it? You don't want to talk about it? Okay. We, just, we can talk about the framework. Oh, so the, this one does follow the social studies framework. Um, this is also, um, they're going to be uh, publishing a new one that's coming out this summer, and that's the one that we're actually going to be getting that follows updates with the FAIR Act as well. That's great. So just to add to that, um, the process we go through when we do textbook adoptions is first to have the state approved standards, then a framework, and then the curricular materials. So last year when the framework was adopted, it came roughly around the same time as legislation passed um, requiring that framework to address um, groups that had not been represented previously in um, history textbooks. And so we waited until after publishers had addressed this and these materials and the um, new version we'll be getting this summer does indeed address those 
um, groups that had been previously unrepresented in our traditional textbooks, history textbooks. Thank you. Explain to me again the DBQ, whatever it's called. I mean, explain to me what that's, the, that, that one, so all the stuff it's going to do. So it's document based questions. Um, these are essentially little, um, they're smaller versions of, of um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, project, kind of like project based learning type stuff. But if they're all written pieces. A lot of the materials are online for the teachers and the students to access, but they do have to look at multiple sources of evidence, create an argument, and be able to back up their argument citing um, evidence from the text. Oh, so, oh, so that, so they're, so project basis, so based on, I don't know, there's a whole thing about the Native Americans and their march for, or tears or whatever they had <laughs> across the United States, which was, it was horrible. Um, and it has, and so they take that, I'm just guessing, and they take that whole thing and study it and everything like that, and they, and, and in, in the DBQ it has what questions that they need to answer about it, or? Well, no, the, so um, in, the, in the materials it has, um, for each of the, uh, like world history or U.S. history or GovEcom, for example, there's essentially ten basic um, time periods that they cover. And so within those, the teachers are able to line them up with the content that they're, t or the, the era that they're teaching. And then in that, there is uh, different sources. So the argument piece can be built from this, or it can be built at a connection with the TCI materials. But the whole idea is that the kids are being able to form arguments and back it up. Okay. Okay, in, in with this book. With this, with these materials, with yes, materials and that big binder that's there next to you is okay. one volume out of two that would come, uh, that the teachers would have access to. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Um, my my son went to the a charter school, um, PCS where they really did a great job of, of articulating their social studies with their literature and English classes so that whatever they were studying here, they were also writing about in, in English class. Can, are we, I've said it like every year for eight years, are we doing any of that yet? Um, doing literacy in the contents or, or beefing up how we teach literacy in the contents is definitely something that we are looking at and that we are um, making plans to improve for the coming year. Okay. We've, we've definitely been talking about that. Okay, so there uh, is a lot of questions about <coughs> things that they can ask about what they're going to be talking about. Yes, yeah, correct. It's not just one piece that the kids do have choice in it. Second. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 So it's um, six. I think she's aye. <laughs> it's six zero one. <coughs> oh God, <laughs> I have stuff to look at. <laughs> okay, I can't read. Can't look at this right now. <laughs> Eight point nine. Second read, and we're doing the Michael stuff. <laughs> what? Yeah, and this is the second read. This is the second reading, so hopefully there's not any questions because this is the second reading. So he can just get up and say second read and we'll vote on it. Come on, Michael. Second read? <laughs> exactly. Oh, because I'm going to do it second point, second read, BP0415 equity. Is there a motion? <laughs> this is a very important policy, and so I will make a motion to approve our policy on equity for all kids. Yeah. Okay, no discussion. Can I have a second? <laughs> Can we have a second? No. No, obviously. You don't have any public statements. I do have a question, actually. Okay. Another question. Okay. 
under number three, it says something about international baccalaureate program. What what program? So so we intentionally <laughs> keep the board policies aligned with um, with CSBA policy. Um, we keep it broad so. The goal is one day for us to have an IB program. We currently, you're correct, do not have an IB program, but it is something that when I became superintendent here, I did say that I wanted to get into one of our high schools, and it still remains a goal. Great. I thought maybe we had we were putting one in. I didn't know about <laughs> it. Okay. No, I would. Yeah, that would be wonderful. If we could do it at all three high schools. Would be better. Thanks. Yes, with Keeping options open. Second. Aye. Aye. Move up, Herval. Move approval. Aye. Move to approve. Aye. Aye. I'll move to approve. All second. All those in favor. Aye. 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 Thank you and see you soon. Uh, good evening, President Osmondson, Superintendent Rodriguez, Board of Trustees and Cabinet. I'm here today to report to you on TransFinder and the efficiencies that we've been able to find using this program. Um, just a little bit of history. TransFinder purchase, we board approved on August of 2017. Um, November, we uploaded uh, our district information, and we began training within our own department. Um, August of 2018 was a big deal. We did a field trip implementation. We revamped the entire process. So we rolled that out to all of our school sites. Um, and then also in August of 2018, our shop started using Service Finder. Um, and then ongoing, we are still doing ongoing uh, district staff, district and s staff and site staff training. Gosh, that was hard to get out. Um, so with TransFinder in place, PVUSD has a time efficient field trip management system with an automated process to request, schedule, budget, approve, and assign field trips. Um, and we can now manage our parts online, schedule technicians, and assign work orders electronically using ServiceFinder. 
Um, and then we continue to implement Route Finder to improve efficacy in, our, in mapping our routes for efficiency um, and safety, of course. Um, so since the start of the 18-19 school year, we averaged an hour, 8.2-hour uh, increase of straight time each day. So that's um, stud or students, that's drivers who work less than eight hours. Maybe their route is only six hours, but they um, sign up to do extra time and they're still being paid on straight time. So that has increased um, on average 8.2 hours a day. But since the start of the 18-19 school year, we've on average decreased overtime by 27 hours per day. Um, and so that's just because we've been able to adjust routes for efficiency and effectiveness. Um, and it averages about 30 minutes per route a day that we've been able to shave off decreasing downtime and just using uh, different routes to get where we're going and things like that. Um, and with Service Finder, we're now able to schedule maintenance and billing of the White Fleet services that were previously outsourced. Um, we are in the middle of this implementation with full implementation coming July 1 will be um, handling all of our White Fleet uh, services within our own um, department instead of outsourcing to the um, area vendors. So there's just a little graph for you showing the extra hours, extra work hours on the left and then the total cost on the right um, of what we've been able to bring down the overtime on. Um, and then again, the increase, the slight increase on extra hours, which is straight time. Um, so what's next with TransFinder? Uh, next school year, 2019-2020, will be RouteFinder full implementation. Um, this program also offers GPS live feeds. It offers real-time bus location, improving the sense of safety with our students, parents, and staff. We have a targeted implementation for 2021 school year on this. Um, and then also with our video system, Stay On Video and TransFinder, there's a live, a live feed feature where if in the case of an emergency, we can tap into the, the bus system and watch the live feed and be able to figure out what's going on, where they're at. Um, and that's also targeted for implementation 2021. Um, and then uh, there's also many options remaining for reporting, uh, student reporting, staff reporting, like keeping up with their licenses and certificates, things like that. Um, vehicle reports, we can pull when our, our, cert, our certs are due for our CHP inspections and other things that we're audited on. Um, so there's a lot of things that remain for us to gather essential data that can be made in making decisions going forward. Thank you for the opportunity to share this exciting program. And any questions? Do we know for fun, I mean, how much money we might be saving? I don't know if we can do it for a year or for whatever. I don't know. Is there, um, is there a possibility of figuring that out? Quick math to date, it was about, what is that, 50000 about already that we've saved. Wow, that's terrific. <laughs> Super terrific. Speci Correct. Especially since transporta transportation comes out of our general fund, it's wonderful to be able to save. <laughs> I try to do that every day. <laughs> you do. Thanks for all you do. Thank you. <laughs> I have okay. a question, Karen, if I may. Yeah. Um, so I know that uh, we currently charge students for a bus pass. Well, we not all students. We charge them a processing fee. Okay. They're not actually being charged to ride the bus. The bus services are free. But in order to get the bus pass, there is administrative costs. Um, for instance, the card that we print, the ink mm -hmm. that goes on it, the person who's printing it. So we do charge them a fee for processing that. And how much is that? $25. $25. Annually. Annually. Um, so if we were to waive that for students, mm -hmm. um, do you happen to know what will be the cost for the, to the district? If my memory serves me, we bring in about sixty to eighty thousand dollars in revenue off of that. Okay. Um, so that's what that would be. All right. Um, but I don't necessarily disagree with you. 
Yeah, no, it, you know, it, it's one of those things with trans transportation it has a huge encroachment in the budget. Right. Um, but at the same time, it just, it just doesn't seem right to me to be charging a service fee to print out their bus pass or whatever it may be. Right. Um, so I think moving forward as we save and continue to implement implement um, different components of the Transfinder, I think it will be good to um, reconsider that Yeah. Um, in the future. Um, I also like the fact that we're no longer outsourcing. So I think that's kudos to you guys <laughs> for that. Thank you. Um, and then also the live video, I think. And any time that we're able to implement something that um, increases student safety in any way, um, it, it's, I'm all about that. So, so thank you so much for what you've been doing. Thank it's you. Some great work. Thank you. So I was thinking, um, so do, do you ever have parents that say, you know, I, I really can't even afford doing the $25? I mean, do you ever I have parents? I do have parents that say that. I've paid the $25 that times I've, and there's also a $5 replacement fee if they lose it. So I've paid the $5 replacement fee a lot just because I get it. Oh, so if a parent says that they, they can't, can't afford it, it you, you go, you pay it. Okay, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do we know about how many of those we get a year? Not very many. Not very many. Maybe between five and ten. Okay. Small. Right. And to elaborate, that's only being charged to regular ed students. That is not being charged to special ed students, Absolutely, correct? Absolutely, that's correct. Or For uh, clarification. Healthy Start students, students in transition, foster youth, they, don't are, they are not charged. I mean, maybe it's something that we can also look at as a possibility to do sort of like a lunch program and like see if there was like a sliding scale fee. Mm -hmm. I mean, if there was some way to incorporate that into it. Um, but it sounds like you've been using this since 2017, so you, you're bringing it back to us tonight as report and discussion for, you know, I mean, I'm getting the 50,000 savings really offset by 30,000, so we're really talking about a $20,000 savings. So why was this brought back tonight if it's been since 2017? When the, when the program was first, um, was first approved, there was a request to bring back the item and so we were asked to bring back the item approximately a year later um, mm -hmm. and so we're just bringing it back so that everyone knows um, that how we are place are putting our money is um, is actually in the end saving us money oh no that's yeah. great I think that's great but we, it's not something we'll be needing to vote on at a future date no right mm -hmm. okay thank you thank you Okay, we're going to do some first readings again on policies. <laughs> You're back. This one's BP 6020. We're getting close. <laughs> um, hello again, President Os Osmondson, members of the board, Dr. Rodriguez. Based on federal program monitoring feedback, we have more policies and administrative regulations that we need to update. Um, again, this is a first read. If there's any feedback, please provide it to myself or Dr. Rodriguez before the Friday before the next board meeting so we can include it. Um, parent involvement 6020 is a policy and regulation based on updating, um, based on the, the update of the, uh, the passage of the Every Student Succeeds Act. Okay, so if everybody's read their board packet. <laughs> okay. Um, so there's no questions, right? Okay. How about 9.3, first reading on new, I guess it's new, AR 5145.9, hate motivated behavior. And I thought we already did this one. Yeah, um, both of the next two are again based on FPM feedback. They're both regarding policies and ARs um, that the board recently passed. The feedback. Uh, was that we needed to include exact language from the Attorney General's guidance document titled Promoting Safe and Secure Learning Environment for All Responding to Immigra um, Immigration Issues. This is the document if anybody's interested in it. Um, basically with these two, the, the reviewer stated that we needed to specifically quote straight from here. All of the um, policies that we've done recently all included the same messages um, throughout them, but um, these two are the, the reviewer said that we needed to specifically 
um, statum and in these two, the AR and then the following BP has the language from the AG's guidance and, um, and, and it's vetted by the reviewer and already approved by him. Okay, because it seems like we've done that. Okay, and I'm going to just go <laughs> every no, 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 no comments. 9.4 first reading update BP 5145.13, uh, and that's response to immigration. And I think we were reading about that too before. <laughs> okay, uh huh. So, it's, yeah, it's, it's the same, it's, it's straight so from the Attorney General's guide. Yeah. And, so it, and this one is the, is the more um, complete version of all the language straight out of the guide. Yeah, so. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. <laughs> now we're going to do uh, the consent agenda. And I just wanted to say thank you um, for the Ryder Berry Farms Migrant Education Grant, which is, I think it's, it's is it $10,000? Ten thousand dollars. It's really great, and it's it's going through Community Foundation, but it is from the Ryderberry Farms, which is really great. Okay, the consent agenda. Can I have a motion? I can I just um, piggyback on you on that. I okay. wanted to thank you for recognizing that because sometimes things kind of get buried in consent agenda. So thank you for just making the comment and publicly thank noticing you. them for that. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Um. Okay. Can I have a motion? Making also move. move. Second. Okay. Comments on it? No. No comments. A second. <laughs> okay. I will call for a vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Um, and there's, oh, there's no to for consent. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Now we're going to do closed session. So just do your one. One expulsion, Maria, and then Danny. So I move to um, I move to approve the recommendation of the district administration for a suspended expulsion for the remainder of the 2018-19 school year, and the fall semester of the 19-20 school year with a placement at another school in the district on a strictly favored contract for student number 1819012. All those in favor? We need a second. Second. Aye. 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 I'd like to make a motion on the closed session item 2.2. .2. I move to approve the certificated personnel report as presented by district administration on March 13th, 2019 with 120 and seven additional action items. Second. A motion and second. Mm -hmm. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion number two from closed session, item 2.3. I move to approve the classified personnel report as presented by district administration on March 13th, 2019, with 51 and 9 additional action items. Motion. Second. second. A second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Read out number. Readout number one, resolution number 18-19-30, be it resolved that this governing board of trustee hereby ratifies the decision of the superintendent to send notice of non-reelection in accordance with education code, the employee whose number identification is 7447, the vote was 5-2. Second. Uh, motion second, okay. Are you ready for all those in favor? Oh, no. it was voted, voted on. Okay. Oh, okay, we did. Oh, we voted. Okay. You need to report okay, out the vote okay. number. <laughs> yeah, 5 that's 2. Okay. No, in closed session, that would have been, uh, was it 5 2 or was it 7? Okay. Oh, that was already voted on. Yeah. Okay. okay. Upcoming meetings. Our next regularly scheduled board meeting will be held on Wednesday, March 27th, here at the district boardroom. <laughs> 